School Superintendent. Delighted to see all of you here tonight. Joining me at the moment is Phil Dwyer, our Chair of the Board. And we are going to go ahead and get started. For our students, we are going to ask that you come from this direction. So if you walk either along the back and down this aisle to receive your award, and then as we call each group, we will be asking you to stay for a group photo uh, for the certain groups. Just two quick announcements also. Our Fairfield Ludlow High School headmaster, Greg Hatz, is not with us tonight, but he wanted people to know it's not because he didn't want to be here, but his own daughter is receiving a very similar award tonight, so he's celebrating as a father. Um, and we are a little bit out of order because we have a few students tonight uh, that are going to their very own concert. So we're going to do those students first. And we are going to start with the CABE Awards. And the CABE Student Leadership Award is presented annually in conjunction with the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. The criteria for selection is based on exemplary leadership skills. And tonight we're going to start by recognizing Emma Torello, Fairfield Woods. Emma is, an ex Sorry. Emma is an exemplary student at Fairfield Woods, earning academic honors each marking period throughout middle school. Emma enjoys helping others in community service. She volunteers at the Torch Club at Wakeman Boys and Girls Club, where she has helped out in many ways, including preparing and serving meals at the Prospect House in Bridgeport. Emma is a talented athlete as well and was an active member of Woods Girls Basketball Team. She also enjoys playing basketball, soccer, and lacrosse on community teams. Emma is described by her teachers as outgoing, helpful to her peers, polite, and respectful with a strong work ethic. She may pursue further study and physical therapy, but is keeping the door open to other career paths. We will miss her next year, but she will be a great addition to the freshman class at Ludlow High School. Congratulations, Emma. And next, we are recognizing William Shostak, also from Fairfield Woods. <laughs> Will has excelled at Fairfield Woods and has earned academic honors throughout his middle school years. He is humble and inquisitive, attributes that make him a good student and a great member of the student body. Will is active in his church and participates in service projects helping others in the community. Will loves science and attributes this to his inspiring teachers at Woods. He hopes to pursue a career in the field of science when he is older. Next year, Will plans to attend Fairfield Ludlow High School as well as the aquaculture program in Bridgeport. He is well on his way to pursuing his love and passion for science. All of us at Fairfield Woods congratulate Will for receiving this honor and wish him well when he joins the freshman class at Ludlow next year. And if we could just get a round of applause for these two before they go to their concert. <laughs> Congratulations. And next we're going to recognize some students for Superintendent's Awards. Thank you very much. The Superintendent Student Recognition Award is presented annually in conjunction with the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents. Criteria for selection is based on community service academic prowess, and leadership in the school community. Our first honoree tonight is Ava Pezzamenti, Fairfield Woods. <laughs> Ava is an outstanding student consistently earning academic honors at Fairfield Woods. She has many interests, but particularly enjoys science class. She is considering work in medicine someday, perhaps as an ophthalmologist. Ava is very active in local theater with roles in productions of Beauty and the Beast, Annie and Shrek. She volunteers at her church, preparing meals at a local shelter and raising money for a Native American high school out west. Ava is a member of the track and field and cross country teams and has a black belt in Taekwondo. She was creator of the Woods Bus Loop Band, a small ensemble that volunteers to play for other students in the school lobby before the day begins. 
Ava was also selected to receive the Superintendent Award at Holland Hill three years ago. Congratulations to Ava on receiving this deserving award twice. Our next honoree is Emmett Derby from Burr. Emmett. <laughs> Emmett loves to help others. In our community, he has taught younger students how to play his favorite sport, Gaelic football, and has been involved in a program called Shoveling for Seniors, where he and his brother help shovel snow at the homes of seniors. Emmett has been part of Burr Student Council twice and was part of an outreach group that made stress falls, sold them, and bought books for a school in a neighboring district. Emmett has deservedly received all ones on his progress report for work, social skills, and effort. We are most proud of the time Emmett has spent helping one particular student at Burr. Every day, Emmett helps this student pack his bag, escorts him to class, sits with him at specials, supports him in gym class, and makes him feel special. We are incredibly proud of Emmett at Burr. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Henry Kelly from Dwight. When asked to describe Henry Kelly, the words kind, has my back, makes me laugh, cooperative, dependable, compassionate, empathetic, loyal, and responsible are how his family, peers, and staff at Dwight School responded. Henry consistently demonstrates excellent work habits and social skills. Over the past two years, Henry has taken a strong interest in history, researching, writing, and sharing his knowledge through PowerPoint presentations, web boards, and plays. Two of his most outstanding presentations focused on the Civil War and the 20th century. Henry lives by a strong set of values. He does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. He is a team player, and he can be paired with any student and learn from the experience. He is a well-rounded individual who finds as much joy on the soccer field as he does having a leaf blower strapped on his back. Congratulations, Henry. <laughs> Our next honoree, Cassidy Meehan from Holland Hill. Cassidy exemplifies leadership, scholarship, and citizenship, and is most deserving of this recognition. She is a natural leader both inside and outside of the classroom. She is kind and patient with all students. She exhibits a maturity beyond that of a typical fifth grader and often puts the needs of others before her own. Cassidy is a superb role model. This past fall, she was elected by both her teachers and her peers to attend a leadership conference at Sacred Heart University. At Holland Hill, she helps others through her participation in Holland Hill Heroes, Safety Patrol, and Job Corps. This year, she has also helped to raise money for UNICEF and has collected food for the Fairfield Food Pantry. Cassidy participates in travel soccer and is active at her synagogue. Holland Hill is honored to have Cassidy as a student and is very proud of her achievements. Our next honoree is Nolan Tierney from Jennings. <laughs> Jennings School is proud to have Nolan Tierney as this year's recipient of the Superintendent's Award. Nolan is an exemplary representative of the Jennings fifth grade. He has contributed to the school community as a former member of the student leadership team. He shares his musical talents as a percussionist in the school band. He is very capable academically and assists others in need on a regular basis. He is insightful beyond his years and has the capability to bring out the best in his peers with his calm, encouraging demeanor. Nolan is also musically involved outside of school. He plays and performs with a percussion ensemble at a local percussion studio. He swims and takes karate lessons. Nolan makes a difference every day. He is a great mo role model for all. Jennings School is very proud of Nolan. <laughs> Our 
Our next honoree is Mahela Taratanu from McKinley. Born in Moldova, Mahela moved to the United States with her family in the middle of kindergarten. An excellent student, Mahela is in the gifted program, is a member of the student council. She is a student leader at McKinley who was chosen to help the commissioner of education learn about school during her tour. Mahela is a member of McKinley Singers and the Fairfield County Children's Choir, which recently recorded Be Our Guest for Good Morning America. Creatively gifted, she has made posters representing each month's character trait, which hang in our lobby. She also makes beautiful boxes, which she fills with clothes for donation to charities here in the U.S. and Moldova. Mahela is an excellent, incredible student who has touched the lives of many students and teachers at McKinley. Congratulations. Next honoree is Asha Joliet Mill Hill. Asha is a young lady of many talents. She has met with success in all academic areas throughout her elementary school years. She participates in athletic endeavors, including gymnastics on the Excel team and soccer on the Old Premier Select team. In 2017, her achievements in gymnastics have led her to the Connecticut State Gymnastics Meet, where she earned a third place medal in the Balance Beam event. Her soccer success has also led to playoff experiences at the state level. Asha was selected for the Mill Hill Leadership Program and attended a conference at Sacred Heart University in the fall of 2016. Her leadership role in the Look for the Good Project at Mill Hill, including organizing the whole school kickoff assembly and making multiple school-wide announcements concerning this gratitude campaign. Asha's positive attitude and strong work ethic make her an exemplary fifth grade role model for her peers. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Otto O'Brien, North Stratfield. Otto O'Brien is a talented fifth grader who excels in all things academic. He is an enthusiastic reader and enjoys the challenge of solving complicated math problems. An avid violinist, Otto was recently chosen to participate in the fifth grade district-wide honors orchestra. Strong in mind and even stronger in character, Otto is a student who can be counted on to help those in need. He is a considerate student who displays his leadership throughout the day and thus was selected to represent North Stratfield at the leadership conference at Sacred Heart University just this past January. In addition to being a role model in school, Otto is a Boy Scout who has helped many through his charitable works. He has participated in beach cleanups, collected, gently used children's books for those in need, and has raised money for St. Baldrick's as part of Team Teddy, where he notably doubled his fundraising from last year. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Natalie Compare from Osborne Hill. <laughs> Natalie excels in school academically and socially. She is both a member of the Gifted and Talented program and a recess ambassador at Osborne Hill. She recently joined the OAKE National Honor Choir and traveled with it to perform at the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia. Natalie participates in the backpack project with her church, donating school supplies to children in need. With a Girl Scout troop, she cooks food for Operation Hope, donates dog toys to the Westport Humane Society, cleans Fairfield's beaches, and collects money for organizations such as the Special Olympics and the Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. When she was in first grade, Natalie held a bake sale where she raised $150 for UNICEF. More recently, Natalie worked with family and friends to sell handcrafted candle holders, donating their impressive profit of over $1,000 to earthquake victims in Ecuador. Congratulations.
Our next honoree is Annabelle Guerrero from Riverfield. <laughs> Annabelle is a hard worker who is generous with her time and talent. Oh, we have a whole group coming. Awesome. As a gifted third grade student, she engaged in many projects, including engineering, futuristic cities, inventing solutions for natural disasters, and conducting deep brain stimulation surgery on an animated website. Annabelle has the ability to connect with people of all ages. In addition to spending a day discussing American freedoms with high school students, she also researched and taught a very successful mini math lesson for a first grade classroom, and the students loved her. She is an avid chess player, which has taught her a lot about life. Annabelle says, in chess, you have to think about your moves before you make them. It's the same with life. You have to stop and think about your actions before you make them. Annabelle is a kind and compassionate young lady and is very deserving of this award. Our next honoree is Margaret Fishback from Roger Sherman. Maggie is an exemplary fifth grade student at Sherman School. While in school, she demonstrates excellent work habits and social skills. Academically, Maggie consistently strives to put forward her very best effort across all areas of the curriculum. Socially, she volunteers for morning safety patrol duties, is a member of the band, is a trombone player, and displays strong leadership qualities among her peers. Within her home community, Maggie volunteers her time at a horse barn where she assists younger students in camp activities in the summer. She also maintains a busy schedule outside of school with dance, soccer, competitive horseback riding, competitive gymnastics, and basketball, all which help keep her an exceptionally well-rounded individual. Congratulations. Our next honoree is George Bentley from Stratfield School. The first one through his classroom door each morning is George Bentley, ready to take on the day and to reach out to others that need a helping hand. George embodies all of the ideals of a good leader. He is thoughtful and decisive, strong and kind, patient and selfless. He is a proud and integral member of the Stratfield student leadership team and also plays the trombone in the school band. Away from school, George participates in baseball and golf and taekwondo. George is an altar server at Our Lady of the Assumption Church and an active participant in his religious education class. One impressive quality he possesses is bringing out the best in everybody he is around, whether in school or outside of school. George is a caring boy who deserves recognition for his leadership and a desire to help others. Okay. Our next honoree is Brian Meager, Roger Ludlow. Brian is an exemplary student who has achieved honors and high honors recognition all throughout his middle school career. He has received the Roger Ludlow Middle School Citizenship Award every year and the prestigious Top Dog Award for his outstanding service to his school and community. Brian is an active volunteer with the following organizations, World Champion Taekwondo, the Special Education Parent Teachers Association, his church, Thomas Merton Center, and the Roger Ludlow Middle School School Climate Committee. Brian is currently working to achieve gold medal acclaim through the United States President's Volunteer Award for accumulating 300 plus hours in one year. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Teresa Spinoza from Tomlinson. <laughs> T 
Tess Espinosa has learned to face challenges and setbacks by seeking out positive ways to help the people around her. In school, she is actively engaged in both the Tomlinson Jazz Band and the district-wide eighth grade honors band. In the classroom, she has earned honors every marking period. In her church and her youth group, she's participated in local mission projects and traveled to Washington, D.C. to work in a homeless shelter. This summer, she will help her youth group plan a mission trip to Ghana. She will also continue to work at the Pilot House, a special needs center to help children perform in their drama programs. On the softball field, she is the catcher. The catcher has to be a leader and act as a leader on the field, picking up her teammates when the pressure is on. Congratulations. <laughs> Next honoree is Jacqueline Caruso, Fairfield High School, Walter Fitzgerald Campus. Jackie is a kind and caring student who transferred to the Walter Fitzgerald campus from Fairfield Ward High School in September. She is dedicated to her schoolwork, classwork, and to the Walter Fitzgerald positive school culture. She has consistently been on the top level in our school as she maintains a GPA of 4.0 or above, and she exemplifies the Walter Fitzgerald respect, responsibility, and integrity. Jackie has overcome personal obstacles to achieve her current level of success. Her accomplishments are an indication of her commitment to education and her overall personal growth. As part of her studies at Walter Fitzgerald, Jackie has participated in our community service learning program. She spends two hours a week at Holland Hill helping in a second grade class as a component of her humanities project-based learning work. Recently, Jackie has shared that her work at Holland Hill has influenced her thoughts about her post-secondary study. Jackie seeks to improve life for herself and others, and we are recognizing her accomplishments as well as her potential leadership with this award. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next honoree is Shay O'Donnell, Fairfield Ludlow, Warner House. Not many individuals can say that they have attended nine different schools in their K-12 career. Shay is one of these arriving at Fairfield Ludlow in her sophomore year. Due to her positivity, resiliency, and adaptability, Shay, regardless of her zip code, excels. Shay has a 4.36 GPA and is a member of the National Math and Science Honor Societies. After her sophomore year, she elected to take three AP courses, and the result of her work was earning A's in all three courses and fives on the AP exams. Despite suffering from medical setbacks, Shay continued to pursue her interest in ballet. She attends a local dance school and works as a customer service representative. She is an active member of the Fairfield Ludlow High School Make-A-Wish Club. Despite all the moving and adversity, Shay wouldn't change a thing, stating, because each experience I've had has made me the person I am today. Our next honoree is Emily DeMasso from Fairfield Ludlow High School, Webster House. Emily's defining quality is her passion, which she applies to both her personal and academic lives. She will stop at nothing to fight for what she believes is right, taking action as a volunteer for Operation Hope and participating in our unified sports program. Her strong leadership skills have catapulted her to become captain of two varsity sports, soccer and lacrosse. Friends, teachers, and teammates can all describe her as intuitive, mature, and kind. On top of all this, she earned a commanding high school GPA in no small part because of genuine love for learning and her willingness to take on challenges. Congratulations.
Our next honoree is Ayana Kara George, Fairfield Ludlow, Wright House. <laughs> Ayana has achieved an impressive 4.1 GPA due to her academic success in the most rigorous classes that are offered at Fairfield Ludlow High School, leading to her induction to all four National Honor Societies. She has an insatiable thirst for knowledge, particularly in the field of environmental science, where she hopes to one day leave her mark. This has meant not only taking AP Environmental Science this year, but also engaging in summer opportunities with the wider conservation sea turtle network in Costa Rica and the United States Virgin Island National Park System in St. John. Whether she is searching the reef for hurt sea turtles, serving a more local community with the Appalachian Service Project, or sharing her Greek heritage through performances of traditional dance, she is well on her way to achieving her goal of becoming a nationally and globally impactful woman. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Natalie Ziltsova, Fairfield Ward, Fitzhouse. <laughs> Natalia cares deeply about school and community and contributes to both in astonishing fashion. Natalia has taken 10 AP courses, achieving exemplary grades in each, as evident from her 4.5 cumulative GPA. She is an accomplished athlete on the cross country and tennis teams, serves as head girl and soprano section leader in the audition group, Women's Choir, and has devoted endless hours training and socializing puppies to prepare them for being seeing eye dogs with guiding eyes for the blind. Natalia has also been dedicated to raising abuse awareness for teens as a presenter, fundraiser, and peer counselor, benefiting students at both high schools and middle schools local PTAs, and the Fairfield Cares Organization. Fitz House, along with the entire ward community, couldn't be more proud of Natalia, not only for all she has done, but for who she is. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next honoree is Sarah Asul, Fairfield Ward, Pequot House. This extraordinary young woman is described by her school counselor as a quiet and powerful leader. Her perspectives are mature beyond her years, as is her concern for others. She has proven to be a strong advocate for young women, spending a great deal of time mentoring at the McKinley Wakeman After School Mentoring and Outreach Program. Her interest in world affairs and providing a voice to all prompted her to create a political literature magazine club at Ward. Sarah is a stellar student, taking many, many advanced courses. She truly embodies every quality of our award acronym, which is why we are so proud to honor her tonight. Our next honoree is Cameron Luther, Fairfield Ward, Townsend House. Cameron is a motivated and personable student who portrays our school's mission of being welcoming, academic, respectful, dynamic, and ethical. He has earned a 4.01 GPA and participated in several AP classes, including AP Economics, AP Language and Composition, AP U.S. History, American Studies, AP Physics, AP Literature and Composition, AP U.S. Government and Politics, AP Calculus AB, and AP Environmental Science. In addition, Cameron is a co-captain of the debate team, co-president of the Fairfield Ward High School Young Democrats, a member of the National Honor Society, a member of the Raising Abuse Awareness for Teens Club, and a member of the Latin Honor Society. In his free time, Cameron accompanied his church youth group on a two-week service trip to India, and from this experience, organized a nonprofit club, Humanity Helping Humanity, 
entirely dedicated to raising support for impoverished children. Townsend House is very proud of all Cameron's accomplishments. Congratulations. And congratulations, those were our superintendents honorees. Next, we're going to recognize the CABE Student Leadership Awards, and they are presented annually in conjunction with the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, and the criteria for selection is based on exemplary leadership skills. We're going to begin with Madeline Crawford, Roger Ludlow. Maddie is an exemplar student who has achieved high honors every quarter in middle school who contributes to our school's literary magazine, Ludlow Light. Maddie is a talented ballerina who participates in fundraising efforts through Dance Across America and has been selected to perform in a special Nutcracker performance annually for the Bridgeport Elementary School. She is a flutist who is a select member of the town-wide Fairfield Honors Band Ensemble. And in Maddie's spare time, she volunteers reading and writing book reviews for Bank Street College and has even traveled with Roger Ludlow Middle School's Ludlow Corps to deliver medical supplies and water, water filtration systems to impoverished villages and remote regions of Ecuador. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Armand Ajul. I said that. Ajumul. <laughs> Armand has been an active member of group group since 2012. This group has provided 50 to 60 families in Fairfield County with food, hygiene products, and clothing. Armand has also volunteered numerous times as a food server at Merton House in Bridgeport and Operation Hope in Fairfield. He has served on the Roger Ludlow Middle School Student Leadership Club and has been asked to attend the Connecticut Association of Schools Student Leadership Conference for the past two years. Further, Armand is an exemplar student who has always been on the Roger Ludlow Middle School Honor and High Honor Roll. Congratulations. Next, we're recognizing Danya Ali Tomlinson. <laughs> Danya is an amazing student who exemplifies leadership through her commitment to academic excellence as well as her activities outside of school. At Tomlinson, Danya is a member of the Chamber Orchestra, a homeroom helper, and an art helper. She puts in 100% effort in every assignment, and her efforts have awarded her high honors all three years at Tomlinson. Outside of school, Danya is on a year-round swim team and tutors at Kumon. Swimming daily while maintaining her grades has taught Danya to be organized and to manage her time efficiently. Danya enjoys being a part of the team on school projects and on her swim team. She likes to assist others and does so without hesitation. Danya's friends, teachers, and family describe her as hardworking, determined, strong-headed, and focused. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Brady Pomer from Tomlinson. Brady is that student who is always focused, always working to help his peers, always taking great pride in the work he produces and the actions that define him as a person. He is one of the youngest on a travel hockey team, plays on a travel basketball team, works with his family every year to raise money in the battle against ALS, and through his piano recitals has raised money many years for St. Jude's. Brady carries with him a quiet integrity based on a few simple beliefs he holds. I believe if you can hold yourself together in and out of school, 
and stay positive through the ride. There's not much that can go wrong. Ever since I was little, I've always felt the need to look out for people. I believe that when everybody can be a good person, that's a heck of a world. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next honoree is Hannah Sharp, Fairfield Ludlow High School. <laughs> Hannah has a wisdom beyond her years and a humility that is uncommon among her peers. She has excelled academically in one of the most rigorous, rigorous programs available at Fairfield Ludlow High School and has deliberately chosen classes in which she has both a great deal of interest and those that will challenge her the most. However, her definition of success extends beyond the classroom, and Hannah believes in the importance of helping others and has, in many ways, embodied this belief in the myriad ways that she has assisted others in achieving her goals. Whether she is working behind the scenes to promote positive interaction on social media or running alongside a peer to help him finish running the mile in the PE class, she has proven to be not only an outstanding student and a competitive athlete, but also a positive role model at Fairfield Ludlow High School. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Paul Gione from Fairfield Ludlow High School. Paul has achieved an impressive 4.6 GPA due to academic success in the most rigorous courses Fairfield Ludlow High School has to offer. Paul consistently makes the most out of his high school experience. He is a member of the National Honor Society, captain of the cross country team, band captain, and holds a position in the English Honor Society. Paul also leads Bible study at his local church. As a result of dedication to his academics, Paul has received the Connecticut Governor's Scholar Award, is a National Merit Scholar, and Class of 2017 Valedictorian. Paul has earned the respect, trust, and confidence of his teachers and peers because he is a genuine young man. Whether Paul is teaching Sunday school or tutoring younger kids through the Urban Impact Connecticut program, Paul has demonstrated that he is a valuable member of our community. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Jacqueline Kaiser, Fairfield Ward High School. It is with great pleasure that we recognize Jackie Kaiser with the CAVE Student Leadership Award. Jackie is a founding member of Raising Abuse Awareness for Teens. She works closely with the Center for Family Justice to spread awareness about risky behaviors and the importance of healthy relationships. She also created a program, Calls for Justice, which donated old used cell phones and currently Starwood Hotels are donating to her program. Last year, Jackie presented to the United Nations Conference on Gender Equality where she addressed violence against women. She is the co-anchor of our weekly Ward TV broadcast. She also received the Youth Activism and Community Service Award by the Center for Family Justice. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Daniel Knorr. Daniel lives the Ward mission, welcoming, academic, respectful, dynamic, and ethical every day. In addition to his 4.48 GPA in challenging AP classes, AP Government, AP Physics, AP Calculus, and AP Spanish, Daniel is an accomplished singer, actor, and cellist. He's been in almost every concert and school play at Ward since ninth grade. Currently, Dan is not only the president of one of our most active organizations, the Key Club, 
but his leadership and responsibility have earned him the office of New England District Level Divisional Lieutenant Governor and Board Member for all of New England. In his spare time, Dan earned the rank of Eagle Scout with the Boy Scouts of America. Congratulations. So, um, this is one of the best nights of the year if, if you're serving on a Board of Education. I want to thank uh, which go, Tricia Pitko, a uh, member of our board, for assisting me in handing them out. We're honoring the students, but students just didn't get here magically. They're supported by uh, family uh, and friends and teachers and the entire staff of our school district. So give yourselves a round of applause. One of your rewards is to sit through the rest of our Board of Education meeting. <laughs> or you can go out and congratulate with your student and we'll take a short break before we start the meeting so that you can say hello to friends and family. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I um, uh, want to uh, open the regular meeting of the Fairfield Board of Education. Uh, present is uh, Mrs. Eileen Lou McCormick, Mr. Mark Patton, Mrs. Jessica Gerber, myself, Philip Dwyer, Mrs. Tricia Pitko. <laughs> I'm out of order, but uh, this is Jennifer Maxson Canelli, Mr. John Llewellyn, and let me welcome to his first meeting uh, Mr. Nick Asa, who is joining our board based on the Board of Selectmen's vote at the last week. If I could have you all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a, uh, a unique uh, um, item on our agenda for the election of the Board of Ed Vice Chairman. Uh, uh, Anthony Calabrese uh, resigned due to his appointment being the Director of Parks and Recreation. And uh, the Board of Selectmen took action, as I just mentioned, to appoint uh, Nick Acer to that position. And now that we're back to nine people, although Ms. Carnell is ill and could not make it tonight, um, we will have an election to replace Mr. Calabrese as vice chairman. So you see that the seat is vacant. Uh, once the election is held, the winner will take that seat, and then uh, Nick will take the uh, vacant seat. Anyways, uh, so the uh, nominations are open. Do I have a nomination for the position of vice chair, Jessica Gerber? I'd like to nominate Tricia Pico, please. Is there a second? A second. Second. Are there any further nominations for the position of vice chair? Uh, seeing none, all in favor of Tricia Pitko as the vice chair of the Board of Education. This will fill a term ending in November when we have our annual uh, election process. Please raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Acer, Mr. Patton, Mrs. Gerber, Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Pitko, Mrs. Jennifer Maxson Canelli, opposed? Mrs. Eileen Lou McCormick, Mr. John Llewellyn. Uh, the motion passes uh, six to two. So uh, take a second to uh, move over, if you will. Take your name tag so people don't think that you are Nick. And Nick, grab your name tag and fill in the vacant seat. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Pitko. Thank you. So now we are time for student reports. As I mentioned at our last meeting, I think this is your last meeting of your service unless 
you are juniors and coming back, but even if you're not, uh, please feel free to, after your reports, if you want to make any comments about your year of service, feel free to do so. So we'll uh, go with uh, Fairfield Low High School first. Uh, Catherine. Hello. Good evening. Um, to start this off, uh, senior internships start tomorrow. Um, all participants will be out of school from the time of May 24th to June 15th, working in the field that they would most likely see fit as their college graduate and what they want to do after. Um, and then on June 14th, there will be a somewhat of a reception for the companies that hosted the Ludlow students and to appreciate the teacher mentors that helped us along the way and gave us guidance in this really interesting but really fun process. Um, next was the Family Consumer Science Night that was held Wednesday, uh, May 17th that I did mention at our last meeting. Um, I do believe that this was the biggest turnout that we've ever had out of my four years um, in this uh, Family Consumer Science Night. It was a bittersweet moment for all the seniors that were involved in both the fashion and in the, uh, in the cooking program. Uh, the food produced by the cooking program was absolutely phenomenal. The macarons were amazing. Um, but the clothes that were produced by the fashion students were stunning. And taking four years of fashion and being with the same group of girls, it was very fun to see the evolution of their styles and the techniques that they used. So it was a great way to see who they are as a person through clothes instead of um, any other way. Um, thirdly, the music awards were given out last Thursday. Um, senior prom was this past Saturday at the Trumbull Marriott. Uh, the students involved did an amazing job with the food, DJ, and venue. It was truly a great way to end the senior year with everyone together having the time of our lives. Um, next, the softball semifinals for FDEC played Darien this afternoon, and the, both the cross teams are in the state tournament. Lastly, we're all excited about graduation on June 15th. Closing this chapter in our lives is is slash will be a truly humbling experience. And I would just like to say thank you to all the faculty members, mentors, student friends, our colleagues at Ward, um, and you, the Board of Education, for helping us just make this year truly enjoyable. And I'm grateful to have been given this opportunity to be a student representative and to give you all the like, new upcoming things that were happening at Ludlow. So I want to thank you again for this experience. Thank you very much. Any questions for our representative from Ludlow? No? Who wants to go first from Wood? I suppose that's me. All right, uh, we're going to start off with the um, sports updates. Um, so we had our varsity baseball game at Harbor Yard against Ludlow. Uh, we were victorious. Um, however, the day before, Ludlow did come out victorious in the softball game, so congrats to them. Um, we have some teams that are waiting to be ranked for their state finals, so we are waiting anxiously for the results. Um, meanwhile, we had the track meet against Ludlow, uh, the boys and girls. The Ward boys team was victorious, whilst the Ludlow girls were victorious, so I guess the playing field is still a bit equal. Um, we had our mock crash two days before junior prom on May 18th with the Fairfield Fire, Police and Ambulance Services, and the Lesko Funeral Home. Um, it was attended by all juniors, and basically um, it's like a simulation. Um, reminding students to be careful as prom night is a big night. Um, and they were uh, given warnings about, you know, the dangers of drinking and driving. Um, also that night, we had our National Honor Society induction ceremony for juniors and seniors, uh, which was really nice to see um, everyone getting together. We had the new um, uh, club leaders uh, uh, elected. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so going off what she said, uh, junior prom, we had that on May 20th. We set that up in the courtyard. We set up a tent and everything. So a lot of the juniors were excited to go, had a lot of fun. Um, on Friday, May 19th, we had Ward Day. There was about 80 presenters, and the uh, topic was Career Day. So we all got to sign, the whole school got to sign up for to go to two presentations. So we all had a really like nice time seeing all the presentations. Uh, looking at uh, all the careers that are available for us after high school. Um, everyone seemed to enjoy it. There was a lot of positive feedback for it. And also on the same day, we had a keynote speaker that everyone was able to attend. And I know Ashley wanted to elaborate on this, but basically it was, uh, it was called um, My First Job, and he was giving us advice on uh, what to do for interviews. 
So yeah, um, the guy who came in was Steven Greenberg from WCBS Radio out of New York. Um, he was basically giving us a presentation as titled My First Job and um, he was giving us advice about what to do for our first interview, um, basically emphasizing that we as, um, as we're applying for jobs should emphasize like what we can do for the place that we want to work at. And he was basically giving us a lot of pointers um, which are really helpful, especially for the seniors who are going into college, who are probably looking for jobs and internships. And it was uh, really helpful. Um, you know, he was emphasizing the importance of giving examples, and um, there was a lot of great feedback from, from the program. Uh, just a couple more notes. Uh, the seniors are all looking forward to the end of the year activities. Um, next uh, weekend on June 3rd, the seniors have their prom, so we're all really excited and hyped for that and then we have our award ceremony on the on june 14th and then graduation on 15th um some closing statements ashley and i are like just really grateful that we had the opportunity to do this for two straight years it was a really great opportunity and i'm usually really bad at public speaking so this really helped me step out of my shell a little bit so i would want to thank uh ward and everyone for just supporting us all throughout the years and thank you yeah um, hello. Um, I've, you know, um, I was really appreciative to be offered the opportunity to come uh, be a student representative at the Board of Education. And just kind of like having our voices heard, kind of like, you know, being representative of the school that I go to, it was like a school that I love. And, you know, it's really fun um, being here and being able to update you on everything that's going on at our school. Um, and I'm, I'm just really proud that I have had the opportunity to do this for you for, again, two straight years. So thank you for all of this. It's been a great experience. Uh, any questions for our representatives from board? This is Maxim Kennelly. I'm, just, I'm hoping all three young ladies could tell us they're, where they're going for next year. Um, I'm going to University of Connecticut at uh, Stores Campus. Uh, I'll be attending Loyola Marymount out in LA. Um, I'll be attending Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Congratulations. Uh, well, thank you very much for your year or two years of service uh, and for occasionally answering Board of Ed members' questions that are thrown at you at the last minute. Uh, we uh, wish you well at your respective college careers and in your life. As always, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> or you can go and accomplish other things as well. Thank you again. Thank you. We're now at the point of the time for public comment on agenda items. If anybody wishes to come forward, please come up to the podium and uh, state your name and address and make your comment. The lights are bright here, so it takes me a little while to make sure nobody's coming forward. I don't see anybody coming forward, so we'll move on to old business, the adoption of four policies. For board members, these were issued at the last meeting, and so I presume that you have brought them with you. Uh, we'll act on them at one at a time. In the first one, A1, uh, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education adopt policy 5141.213, students administrating medication, opioid overdose prevention. Do I have a motion? This is Max and Kennelly. Mr. Patton seconded. Uh, Mr. Max and Kennelly, do you have any comments that you wish to make? Uh, no, I'll simply say that for all four, I received no questions. So uh, aside from the one that I had prior to the last meeting uh, from Mrs. Lou McCormick, which I addressed at the last meeting. Um, so I won't be adding anything to either of, uh, to any of the four. Any comments from board members? Any questions from board members? Mr. Llewellyn. Thank you. Uh, I did have one question as it relates to uh, the definition of school medical advisor. So if we're looking at the first page uh, under delegation of responsibility, it looks as though a school medical advisor is, is a defined term, but I'm not sure if it was. Is that someone who is a district employee or is that someone who is a doctor consulting for? Um, I was hoping Mr. Coyne could come up and help me with that one or shout it from the seats. It's probably is better if you, this is being recorded, I believe, so it's better if you do come up. Sorry, to the I shouldn't podium. have given you that option. 
And of course, state your name and position with the school district. <laughs> we'll leave that out of the minutes. Yes, please. Uh, the school medical advisor is uh, Dr. McDonald, and he serves on the Fairford Board of Health, and in that also in that role as a school medical advisor. So, any of the he's not an employee of the board, but any of the medical uh, information that we need beyond our school nurses or beyond the supervisor of nurses uh, is referred to Dr. McDonald. This is a follow-up. Is this is the school medical advisor always a member of the Fairfield Board of Health? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. Okay. yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pat. Do you know that? And I do apologize for drawing a blank on his I name don't when he asked. I believe that's so. correct, because the Board of Health members are are nominated through the standard channels. So I don't believe that he has to be a member of the Board of Health. Yeah, I, I don't know that, that he is. So. That he he works for the Board of Health. Correct. He's connected with the board, but not for us. He's a great and very knowledgeable guy. But <laughs> thank you very much. Any other questions, Mr. Llewellyn? No, I'm good with that one. Thank Any you. Any other questions from board members? Seeing none, this is a voting item, so we'll go out to the public. Any member of the public that wishes to make a comment on the adoption of this policy concerning uh, administering uh, medication to students, please come forward. State your name and address. I don't see anybody coming forward, so back to the board for the vote. But oh, Mr. Patton has a question. Uh, through the chair to Dr. Jones, um, inevitably, you know, unfunded mandates like this uh, always have budget implications. So under uh, the required training and prevention training plan C, um, it says the district will create a plan to be implemented no later than July 1st, 2017, requiring the training of all school professionals, fire professionals, et cetera. Um, do we have any idea um, between time frame wise and cost wise of what implications that might be? I would actually defer to the policy committee. I don't know if they discussed that at all. We um, did, and I'm trying to find my notes on it. Um, hold on one second. Sorry about this. All right. I'm not putting my notes. I know that uh, initially we um, met with uh, the nursing supervisor in, of the district, and she spoke of how she is already doing the work of communicating with the company that makes this um, about getting some free samples to a large degree that she can. Um, and so some of that we're already having in. Um, I don't believe it's going to co be sufficient for the entire district and what we're looking to cover. Um, I don't have final numbers on that, but that is something that we had discussed in policy. That's really just for cost of materials, though, right? Correct. So in terms of actually the time to train the staff. Actually, she made no reference to that. And I, I'll admit that cost of training didn't come up because I believe that it came, that it was something that she would be in charge of with staff and training of the staff. Um, I, I'm happy to go and confirm that that is the case. Um, but I, that didn't come up as a topic, the cost of training. So it's basically the Board of Health. Um, or the, the nursing staff, the, the nursing supervisor to the Board of Health, well, that person is solely responsible for training all staff in these techniques. It's your understanding. That is my understanding. Okay. And frequently we, I don't know that it's for this case, but frequently with state mandates for training, they'll get scheduled as, uh, as time permits within the scheduled professional development days. Any other questions on this policy? If not, um, for the board's vote, uh, the motion in front of you is that the Board of Education adopt policy 5141.213, students administrating medication, opioid overdose prevention. All in favor, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, and just as a side note for, board, for members of the public who might be noting, uh, while Nick, Mr. Asa, is uh, a new board member, uh, he has taken the opportunity to read the policies given out at the last meeting and talked with uh, Jennifer so that he is up to speed for voting purposes. The second item, uh, 6B, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education adopt policy 5144.1, students' use of physical force. Do I have a motion? This is Max and Kelly. Mrs. Gerber seconds. Mrs. Max and 
Canelli, any comments? Nope. The answer is no. Board members, any questions or comments on this particular board? Mr. Llewellyn? Thank you. Um, a couple of questions here. One is under the definition of school employees, we have uh, a, a wide list, which includes, say, substitutes. Um, and then when we define further back uh, training required, uh, we don't give that same list. It's, it, they're not necessarily par parallel to one another. Um, so I don't know if we should eliminate folks within uh, the school employee list who may not get training, or if we should be more specific back in the definition, um, which I believe is training should be provided to school professionals, paraprofessionals, staff members, administrators. So that's a different list than the folks we're defining as the school employee. So for example, you know, if substitute teachers don't receive training, <coughs> uh, but they're defined as a school employee, and the policy talks about school employees being able to administer restraint, um, I'm not sure that we want to have that same list. And the easiest way to deal with it could be to just strike substitute teachers uh, because the others look like they should probably all receive training. But if uh, we could get an administrator to comment on if that's a true statement or not, it may, not, may or may not be an issue. And that did not come up as a topic. Um, we focused on other aspects. We're looking at the crisis intervention teams quite a bit. Um, I don't have a reaction to that. Um, that wasn't something we looked at. Obviously, I didn't ask anybody ahead of time if there's a reason for the different lists. This is not one that we modified. Um, so this was an, you know, entirely a suggested policy that has been used elsewhere. So I don't have a reaction to that. I would not want to change anything without, again, as, as you have asked, checking with an administrator in terms of the difference in the list. Do we have any administrator who wishes to come forward and... Uh shed some light on this question? You might want to switch seats. And so ju just to clarify the question, so the detailed list under school employee, you're questioning whether on that list substitute teachers should be eliminated? Should so if, if the policy references school employees, right? Kind of throughout as being able to do what's required. Um, it also then talks about who gets training. But if, say, substitute teachers, I'm just using that as an example, don't get training, are they able to use restraint, physical force? And I would think that the answer would be no, because it probably is not cost effective to train all substitute teachers. So if they were struck from this list, the list would be more parallel to the list in the back. Okay. Does that, is that clear, Mr. Coyne? Yes. It, uh, so under, uh, under training, either does it need to be stricken or given a separate line, or under training, does there need to be exception language that this does not apply to substitutes? Or, Right, or to strike them from the definition of front. Well, I don't know if I would strike the definition of employee and strike substitute teachers from the definition of employee because they are employees. But there are specified people who must be trained. Um, it's not required that substitute teachers be trained. In fact, I believe there's pending legislation to change the, the uh, list of people who must be trained. Uh, because it was seen as a mandate that uh, was not completely practical to implement, right. but the legislation's pending. And, and I think my only response to that is in school employees, that is not a universal list. That is a selected list. For example, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, maintenance or, or custodial. Listed right, because on they don't have direct, they don't have direct supervisory contact with kids. Correct. But my point is that's a selective uh, definition of school employee for the purposes of this policy. Well, I mean, we could we could choose not to, you know, not to vote on it or send it back to committee, and we can 
investigate it further with uh, with Cave if that's uh, well. Like. And I've got two other comments, so we might want to do that. And I apologize for bringing these up last minute, um, but I did just get the chance to to read this through. Um, and if we look at D, and these pages are not numbered, I, so let's see, page one, two, it's the third page, D. Psychopharmalogical, pharmalogic, I can't pronounce it, but that is, uh, school employees may not use that except under these circumstances. All right, hold on, I apologize, I can't find where you're pointing out. D. Okay, well, I've got a D there. Oh, that D, sorry. Okay. So if, if, if we look at that particular area there, it says school employees may not do it except under these circumstances. When we look at the training, the training only talks about physical. It doesn't talk about the administration of, of, of an agent or of, of, a, of a drug. So clearly I would think we'd want people trained on that before they're allowed to do it. So that would, I think, probably belong down in G as well. And it would also belong on the following page under required training. And you said you had a third comment? I do. Um, if we go to F, a reasonable effort shall be made to provide such notification immediately after such physical restraint. I'm not sure such notification modifies anything. I think that should probably be a reasonable effort should be made to provide parental or guardians notification immediately after. I'm not sure what such notification. Um, that was language we looked at. Perfect. So what does that modify? Um, so those are your three questions. Uh, does the chair have any responses to all three? Um, I mean, at this point, it, it's obviously hesitations i don't have immediate responses to all of them uh, the training one so i would have no problem holding this policy either we can bring it back because we have another policy meeting prior to mm -hmm. um the next one and either it'll be coming forward in its same form in which case i'd be recommending to the chair that it be a voting item and i would simply have answers for you or we could possibly have language changes and i would leave it up to the board if they feel comfortable with it as a first mm -hmm. read or a voting item so at the chair's recommendation I'll suggest that we allow her to withdraw this motion on unanimous consent. Is there any member of the board that is uh, not happy with withdrawing it? Okay, the motion is therefore withdrawn. <coughs> it will be placed on the next regular meeting agenda for action. And uh, we understand that the committee has an opportunity to meet between now and then to uh, study the three issues that Mr. Llewellyn, Llewellyn brought up. Moving on to item 6-3, triple I. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education adopt policy 6342 instruction, 6142, new glasses, instruction, basic instructional program. Do I have a motion? This is Max and Kelly, seconded by Mrs. Gerber. This is Max and Kelly, any comments? No comments. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, we'll go out to the public. Uh, any member of the public that wishes to make a comment on this policy, instruction, basic instructional program, please step forward, state your name and address. I see nobody rushing forward. Back to the board for action. The motion in front of you is that the Board of Education adopt policy 6142, instruction, basic instructional program. All in favor, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. And tonight, unanimous is 8-0. The uh, last policy, uh, item four, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education adopt policy 6173, instruction, homebound slash hospital instruction. Do I have a motion? Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, uh, Mrs. Grover seconds. Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, any comments? No. Nope. From members of the board, any questions from members of the board? Mr. Llewellyn. Uh, these are going to be a lot easier than those. Uh, in the first line, hospital, uh, sorry, home and hospital instruction shall be a teaching service available. How are we defining a teaching service? Are we talking about direct instruction or are we talking about internet? Are we talking about, how are we defining teaching service? Um, as I recall, it could be either. Um, 
that was on a line that stuck. I think we referenced it at some point. You know, is this play? Is this what we're talking about with Plato? That's is this exactly what we're talking about with um, someone actually in person? I'm looking down at the PPT um, paragraph. Uh, if that stipulated it more specifically. Um, no, I think so. I, I believe it can be. It's it's dependent on the circumstance, but I believe it could be either. Okay. So when we go to the third paragraph, home instruction may also be provided for students who have been excluded from the regular school attendance for disciplinary reasons? Right. That instruction is going to be defined as direct or teacher? Right, although I, if I recall correctly, and hopefully Mr. Coyne can do this for me with a nod, this is something that's legislation that's before Connecticut currently where they may be changing this. Is that correct? That they're looking at the um, the, man the responsibilities of the districts with regard to the instruction of students on expulsion, making it required, correct? At the, the number of hours, I know that there's something in that that was changing. Sorry, um, and so that and and the reason I asked is I thought in the past we had talked about it having to be because when we talked about the budget we had talked about it it, it being teacher-led right instruction. This doesn't necessarily say that, and I didn't know if that reflected what's going on in Hartford or not. Even, if I may say, even when it's online, it still has a teacher behind it, and I, I would be concerned if we actually started tying this that it had to be a live body, because... Oh, I'm not. I'm just trying oh, okay. for clarification. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um... And then just clarification in the next paragraph, please. No teacher during the school year shall accept rem uh, remuneration for tutoring students in his or her own class unless the student is designated as homebound and the tutor is employed by the Board of Education. That remuneration, mm -hmm. fr from whom is that? So a, a currently employed teacher cannot recommend to a parent, I think you need to hire me as an off-hours tutor. That's not allowed. Okay. On the other hand, if so that no teacher, but if your teaching role is you're employed as a tutor by the Board of Education, then that would be a different situation. So this remuneration is only acceptable when it's being paid for by the Board of Education. It's not That's my reading. My parents. That's my reading. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if they're talking about something that's in addition to what the district is providing. Well, that that's I don't what know. I'm wondering. Um, um, that didn't come to, the, this paragraph did, that clarification did, the additional example you're talking about, I don't know, because that's not something we talked about. So should we add the language, uh, no teacher during the school should accept remuneration from, you know, an outside party? I mean, is, that what, is that what it's trying, what, what's the intent? The intent is that you could have a conflict of interest with teachers recommending to parents I agree. tutoring services, and, and by the way, you're best off it. having me be the one hired. I agree. Um, so that's my reading of it. I didn't need clarification for that because I understood what that intended. I'm not sure what is not clear about it. The word unless is what's not clear about it because I would assume that uh, if the teacher is working, you know, quote unquote, overtime. Or, or doing private tutoring on behalf of the district, that they'd be remunerated for that or they'd be given uh, a, a break in a class or something. So there'd be some sort of compensation. So this would imply to me that a teacher could accept remuneration uh, from a student or a student's parents. Okay, well, that I can't speak to. I don't want to try to make up an answer to that, Dr. Jones. I don't know if you can, um, but I can't speak to that because that wasn't something we talked about. And I don't know what, our, I don't know what the practice is. Well, I mean, the general practice would be whatever we have set for the homebound, if that's 10 hours, and we are actually paying for that teacher, right. we wouldn't, um, we would have an ethical issue with a teacher saying, well, just hire me for 20 and pay me extra. I would still read that, that they're going above and beyond what this policy allows that teacher to do. I think that's what you're saying. It, it is, but I'm trying to figure out. To, to me, it can be read either way, so I don't know if we need to clarify except remuneration from a source other than the Board of Education for tutoring. Uh, Mrs. Maxton Canelli, do you uh, believe that the uh, policy is clear in terms of the intent? 
well, it's clear to me, but again, I mean, this applies to me. So I, I understood what it meant, and I've seen it in practice. So it's, uh, it is clear to me. You wish to and so it? I, I don't have an amendment to offer to it because it's, mm -hmm. it is clear to me. So, do but you wish to move the motions on the tables? Do you wish to move forward on the motion? Not hearing any amendments, sure. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments from board members? Mr. Patton. On that first page, uh, the third paragraph, home instruction uh, may also be provided. Um, is it definitely may? And if so, whose discretion shall, could it be shall be provided? I mean, it, may means we could do it or we don't have to do it. So whose discretion is the may if that's, is it the teachers? Is it the, the, the central office staff? Deferring to you on this. I would say may and shall really I would want to and unless Mr. Coyne knows the answer that's a legal um, piece I yeah. think you would want to have the attorney weigh in to make sure we're using the right language. Mm -hmm. Yes. So may is a permissive word that allows for the differentiation between two ages of students. That's the answer I was looking for. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from board members? Mr. Llewellyn. I guess I'd like to make a motion back on the remuneration. So in the second line, unless the student is designated. Let's catch up to the second line for the secretary. Second line, last paragraph. Yeah. Go ahead. Second line, last paragraph, correct. Unless the student is designated as homebound, as a homebound student and the tutor is remunerated by and employed by the Board of Education. So we will clarify the remuneration. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Kelly, do you have any? Uh, first, is there a second for the motion? Mrs. Lou McCormick, Mrs. Maxson Kelly, do you have any comment on that? I guess to me that's unavoidably redundant. Um, because if you're employed by, you are remunerated by. So I, again, I don't need the clarification because I, I understand. But this isn't you. This is the public reading this. this I, is I, that's a, but, again, that, but we come in with our bias. And so for me, it is clear. And saying paid by and employed by is redundant. So I'm never seeking redundancy. So I don't see the, the value in making that change. That's oh. my only point. Okay, so Mr. Llewellyn, do you wish to make a comment on in support of your motion? Well, I do. It's because it's modified by the word unless. So it's talking about uh, accept remuneration for tutoring uh, unless, so there, there's an exception there. Um, unless a student is designated as a home, you could add another sentence, no remuneration shall be paid by anyone other than the district, but that was more wordy. I tried to go with three words rather than a sentence. And yes, if I had a whole sentence, it would probably be much more clear. But I think that three words may actually get past this board, but maybe not. Okay, so the motion's in front of us. Mr. Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, do you have any uh, comments since this is your uh, policy? Not yours, but as chair of the policy committee? Um, the only thing that I think may... I guess to, just to make clear Mr. Lowen's point, is the fact that the second reference is to a tutor and not the teacher the point that's not clear? In which case, if we changed the word tutor to teacher, then it becomes clear that you're referencing one and the same. No, because the teacher or the tutor would be is being modified by the unless. So it, it's an exception. So whether it's a teacher or a student or a tutor, they are um, able to be paid under my reading of this by, by anyone if they're a board of ed member, if, if they're employed by the Board of Education. Okay, I, so any other board member have a question on this amendment? Mrs. Lou McCormick. Can I suggest a revision to the amendment? Uh, no, you could make an official amendment to the amendment, but 
uh, we have an amendment on the table, so therefore that has to take precedence. I can withdraw it if you'd like to tell me what your language is. Okay, yeah, I'll do that if, if you're okay with that. Sure. I'll withdraw my uh, motion since you seconded it. Is the board in unanimous consent that Mr. Llewellyn remove his motion for amendment? Sure. Nobody's objection, so it is withdrawn. Now, do, are you ready with a, another amendment? I can propose this amendment, and if people don't like it, then I can withdraw it as well. But why don't I just make the motion? Make the motion. I'll make the motion for this amendment. So the first sentence would stay as is, where it says, no teacher during the school year shall accept remuneration for tutoring students in his or her class, period. And then, however, if a student is designated as a homebound student, a tutor may be employed by the Board of Education. I don't know if that makes it clearer. Can you clarify where the change is in that sentence? You want to see it? I will second that. So uh, once this gets copied down, I'll ask the secretary to read the amendment that is in front of us so the board is clear on what's in front of us. Amendment that is in front of us is no teacher during the school year shall accept remuneration for tutoring students in his or her class. However, if a student is designated as a homebound student, a tutor may be employed by the Board of Education. Is the board uh, understanding of that? Is there a second for that as it's written? Uh, Llewellyn uh, is seconded. Uh, any further discussion from Mrs. Lou McCormick or Mr. Llewellyn on uh, the uh, motion? I actually think that's a lot better put than the way I've had it, so no, I appreciate that. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, as the chair of the policy committee, do you have any uh, comment? Uh, my comment is simply I want to make absolute certain that this represents the practice of the district. Um, I don't otherwise have a problem with the wording change, um, but again, I want to make sure that there's Sometimes there's a nuance to a word or a reason for a phrasing that's not occurring to me. And so before I vote on it um, to Dr. Jones or through Dr. Jones to any staff member who's actually implementing this, if that amendment reflects the practice of the district. I believe it does. Yeah. Okay. With that answer, do you have any objection to this amendment? I do not. Okay. Any other comments from board members concerning this amendment to the original motion? Um, so let me go out to the public. This is a comment on the amendment and amendment only. Any members of the public that wish to make a comment on the amendment to the homebound hospital instruction policy, please come forward. Uh, Mr. Smaller. Yeah, thank you. Bob Smoller. Um, in this case, I'm speaking as a math teacher. And um, I would like to just give you the consideration that we do have students who are not designated as homebound students who miss a quarter or a semester because of illness or injury over the course of the year. And the only way that they can get the graduation credit they need to complete that course is to get some tutoring paid for by the parent or, you know, if they're designated by the board that's willing to pay for it, then that works as well. But I can think of two instances right now where students with illness or injury are being tutored to try to catch up because they were not able to come to school to receive their instruction. And um, in those instances, I just, you know, it, sometimes the classroom teacher is the best person to do that tutoring since they've been their instructor for the portion of the year that the student could attend class. So what I might suggest to you is that you keep the language that Ms. Lou McCormick has recommended, but maybe add something to say they can do it with the permission of the superintendent uh, where appropriate. Uh, and that would give the flexibility to handle these kinds of situations as they come up. I have a student like this right now 
that is uh, we're dealing with this issue. Thank you. Uh, back to the board. Um, I'll only make one comment. I, um, the idea of trying to wordsmith a policy that's been in front of us um, and do it at the last minute at a board meeting without advance notice to people, I don't think that's good process. So even if the uh, chair of the policy committee were to be happy with this uh, by an instant answer on the fly, I don't think I can vote for this simply because I, I, the, the uh, law of unintended consequences, you never know when this subtle change then has some impact that nobody expected. Uh, Mr. Llewellyn, were you going to raise your hand? Mrs. Max and Kennelly. Um, I will be in favor of the amendment, but I would like to use this moment to reiterate what Chairman Dwyer just said. Um, it's really important I get these comments ahead of time. I ask it every meeting. Please may I get the comments and questions ahead of time. I don't like to surprise staff with it. I'm not always, if it's not something we explicitly discussed in committee, then I am not prepared always to speak to it. And, and especially because this can involve legal situations, I need to be prepared. So I would like to emphatically reiterate to this board, please get me the questions ahead of time. I don't want to assume that a small question is not a big deal. Um, I understand that on the first reading that that's not always possible. You might want to look at it once and then you take a second chance. But I can't agree more. I, I, I will be in favor of the amendment. Um, I do think that the wording works fine. I'm willing to do that. And only with Dr. Jones' assurance that this does reflect our practice do I feel comfortable going ahead with this. Um, but I would repeat, please, this is not the process I re ask for every meeting. I never assume it's what anyone will do. I say it every time. Thank you. Uh, back to the board for a vote. This is a vote on the amendment and the amendment only. Do any board members need to understand the amendment that's in front of us? I'll just read the full paragraph. Um, no teacher during the school year shall accept remuneration for tutoring students in his or her class. However, if a student is designated as a homebound student, a tutor may be employed by the Board of Education. All are understanding. All in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Mrs. Lou McCormick, Mrs. Gerber, Mrs. Pitko, Ms. Pitko, uh, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Max and Kelly, Mr. Llewellyn, all opposed. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Patton voted in favor as well. All opposed, Mr. Dwyer, the motion passes seven to one. Those four policies are adopted. Thank you very much. Oh, no, the main motion, sorry. Uh, now the main motion as amended. Uh, uh, this is a voting item as a main motion as amended. Actually, so we go out to the public. Any member of the public wish to come forward and talk on this main motion, please come forward. State your name and address. Suzanne Miska, 123 Rygate Road. Um, while I appreciate the, the intent of the policy, and, and I think it's a strong policy, um, I, I think the last speaker kind of highlighted it. There's a, there's a disconnect between this policy and the process. Um, if kids are coming down and getting hit with a concussion, um, the response time of getting tutor and process in motion to help these students while it's outlined in this policy is not necessarily hitting the parent and student. And I have a problem that if a child is out due to a concussion or mononucleosis or Lyme disease or something that is a medical condition, um, that parents should have to pay a member of the district to tutor their child to keep them up to speed. Um, the intent of the policy is that that's what the district is doing. Um, my concern is that the intent of this policy and the process in place are not necessarily meeting up. And that's why I hope we can get this process and the policy back in line so that parents aren't paying for tutoring um, when their children are unable to attend school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other member of the public wish to come forward? Uh, seeing none, back to the board for vote. If Actually, we... Mr. Dwyer, please. Mr. Actually, I have a comment. Um, I, I was going to make the motion a second ago, but I do think that uh, Mr. Schmoltz brings up a good point that if the superintendent does uh, pre-approve it in writing, that there shouldn't be a problem. We should not do that to the exclusion. But what we don't want is, is people doing it uh, just kind of off kind of the reservation, so to speak. So uh, I would like to get a sense of the board as to whether or not people would be willing to entertain that uh, addition to the language that was just approved. The amendment. Uh, you state the language specifically so that we can poll the board? Uh, 
I believe it would be to add a comma and say unless approved by the superintendent in writing. But I don't know. I'd have to hear back the exact words. Any uh, if board members are aware, uh, any comments from uh, board members regarding a um, amendment by consensus? Mrs. Maxson Kennelly. Um, I completely understand Mr. Smoller's point um, and appreciate that Mr. Llewellyn is picking it up. Um, however, I can only speak of my own experience and practice, which is when a student is out, whether you're contacted by the parent, more often it's by the guidance counselor saying, this, you need to be aware of this situation with this child who will be out this long. We are working whether they, in some cases, get an official 504, in which case the teachers will be governed by that as they work, or whether you're asked <laughs> simply to work with the student. Um, it's, I can entirely empathize because sometimes it can be an awful lot of extra work, but to me, it's part of my job. I have to do that. Um, I would not be in favor of starting to open the door and therefore open the door for Dr. Jones to starting to decide, well, in this case, this teacher should be paid extra for this tutoring position, um, but in that case, no. It, it's, I wouldn't even begin to know how to set the criteria for determining which parents are in a position where you're going to have to pay for that tutor versus this is what the teacher is going to have to work out in his or her own time. Um, and please understand, I would love the idea of there being such a thing as overtime pay for teachers because man would I be rich. But um, it, it's, I just, I can't imagine the criteria you could set so that parents would be assured that this was going to be done uh, fairly and it, it is absolutely in no way impugning teachers. I, as a teacher, I can't imagine how they could come up with that criteria for myself. Um, you know, they want to take a, a point one of my uh, teaching load, one of my billets off, and I become the tutor for that child. Well, that's something, that's a whole different arrangement. Um, but actually involving an exchange of cash for my own student, I just, I, the, if the thought is interesting, I cannot see how it can be done fairly. Other uh, uh, members wish to make a comment? Mrs. Lou McCormick. So in response to that, is it our understanding then by approving the language as it is that in fact the case that was cited should not in fact be taking place where a student should be in fact paying outside cash to a teacher to tutor them in the event of a coma or whatever kind of concussion or not coma, yeah. concussion. <laughs> coma would be I some very that would be really subliminal bad. tutoring. <laughs> That'd be really bad. Um, so some, some sort of an event where they were out of so is that how we should be reading this at this point, that we shouldn't be having that type of activity going on in the district? I guess I want to understand what this policy tells us we should be doing. What the policy is saying is that, well, again, just straight up, and, and so aside from any situation of homebound or hospital, teachers cannot be paid to tutor their own students, again, because of the inherent conflict of interest that that could potentially set someone up for, accused of fairly or not. Um, for the student who is coming back from the concussion. Again, the tutoring with your own teacher is something that a parent then should not be asked, that you are paying for the tutoring for your own child in the subject in which your child is enrolled. Um, now that's not to say that a parent might not say, I would like something to supplement that, the number of hours that that teacher has in his or her schedule. I would like to accelerate that. There are then other, t I mean, never mind that there are math learning centers and other ways to get additional help. Um, but if a parent so decided to pay a tutor, it's simply that it cannot be the teacher by whom their child is being educated. And while I recognize the inherent flaw in that of, well, who best knows the curriculum and this, te this student's strengths and weaknesses, um, then the teacher who is teaching that student, I completely hear that, um, but it is setting up tremendous potential for conflict of interest. I hear. Oh. Okay, so Mrs. Lou McCormick, you want to have a follow-up? So I guess I can agree with that as well. I mean, I can see both sides of it. I guess my concern is that we implement this consistently and that if we're going to do it one way, we do it one way and then that is the policy of the district. So I guess my question then to Dr. Jones is that is how Ms. Canelli just described it how we as a district will then implement this policy going forward and then the cases as recited should no longer occur and that it, in fact outside um, compensation should not be occurring for a teacher by his student even if the student is out for some period of time for some sickness or injury. 
And that's the question, I'm sorry, through the chair to Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it goes back to looking at the policy on the very first paragraph where it talks about a student who is out for a period of two weeks or longer due to ver verified medical, uh, but it also talks about if they're absent from school for short, repeated periods of time, generally for students who have a concussion, for instance, those students will miss a lot of class. So I, I don't think, it's not necessarily a conflict of interest, I believe, in what our, our speaker shared. I think it may be a, uh, looking at our practice and how we are actually determining who needs a tutor and who does not, um, and making sure that that process is very clear. I guess the question really is, is should the parents be paying the teacher outside, or should it be that the district is compensating the teacher for making up the work? If it's, a, if it's a student who, for instance, has some medical issue and they're out for two weeks or longer, or it is a short, repeated period, we should be providing that. If the parent chooses to hire a tutor, it just shouldn't be just for extra tutoring, which often parents will do. It shouldn't be the teacher who has that child in their classroom every day. Any uh, comment on that, Mrs. Pitko? Ms. Pitko, my apologies. I wanted to answer that, but also answer to John because he asked whether I was in favor of supporting it. I have to agree with Mrs. Max and Kennelly because I have been a tutor to students. I've also been a tutor paid by the district for homebound instruction. I actually did that for many years, um, especially the kids that were expelled. But I've also offered my services to my current students after school, not for pay, just to help them. They're asking something very specific. If the student is on you know, a medical leave or a homebound tuner, then the district should pay for it. If the kid wants extra help, I can choose to offer myself after school unpaid, or the parent can choose, like Mrs. Max and Kelly said, to go to one of these other places to get tutoring. But I think, like you said, we have to be very clear, which is why I agreed with the amendment, the original amendment. And uh, Mr. Llewellyn, for the same reason, I don't want to edit on the run. Um, I would uh, not be supporting the uh, an amendment if you put it forward. I, yeah, and that's why I went out for a sense of the body, and I appreciate everyone's input. I, I think, oh. you know, listening to the teachers, that's kind of what they want. So I was responding to what I'd yep. heard and want to make sure we vet it first. Okay, so you have no amendment to put forward at this time. Thank you. So if the board is ready to vote, all in favor of the main motion as amended, please raise your hand. It is unanimous with eight people here. Okay, uh, we are now up to item seven, uh, which is uh, first reading of new course computer science principles. Dr. Boyce, uh, uh, we, I don't see any screens, so we have the, an attachment in the packet, but uh, you'll speak to us from the podium so we can stay here. Dr. Meg Boyce, Director of Secondary Ed. As the board knows, we typically do not send you um, new courses for approval outside of the regular renewal process. But about a year ago, uh, Mr. Paul Zatomi, who's a business teacher at Fairfield Ward, brought this course to my attention. And I believed it was important enough that we not wait about four years would, when the business department curriculum would come before you again. Last year, the um, College Board added a new AP exam on AP computer principles. And as um, I looked at the course and listened to Mr. Zatomi explain it to me, it, it's a, it was apparent that it was a course that would add greatly to our, our program of studies and would appeal to a large variety of students and really encourage them to perhaps take more courses in computer science and, and various STEM subjects. Um, the course only requires Algebra 1. It can be taken concurrently with AP Computer Science before it or after it. We have staff already in our schools who can teach it. It requires no uh, budgetary support. We don't need to purchase anything, equipment or textbooks to offer it. And I believe it would um, be appealing to a lot of students, especially as you recall with the um, eighth grade course we now offer in coding. I think there'd be many ninth and 10th graders who would be interested in taking this course. So Mr. Zatomi and I met with the headmasters and the housemasters who oversee and supervise business. Um, they agreed that it would be a good course to include. 
I presented it to um, Dr. Jones and also with the Curriculum Council um, who reviewed uh, the curriculum document that you see in your packet. So I'd like to ask Mr. Zatomi to talk a little bit about the content of the course and why he believes it would be valuable for us to offer it. And this is enclosure number one in your packet. Good, afternoon. Good evening, Lord. Uh, my name is Paul Zatomi. I'm a teacher at Fairfield Ward High School. I'm a business computer science teacher there. Uh, as Floyd uh, had mentioned that I did bring this to our attention. I am also the AP computer science teacher at Ward High School as well. Um, microphone. Talk closer microphone. to the microphone. Is that better? Um, about 10 years ago or so, AP College Board uh, asked uh, the computer science teachers their opinion um, on a new course, and um, we gave it to them. And we didn't think they were going to take our opinion uh, to heart, and they did. They created a app mobile-based course completely free uh, to schools uh, that attracts uh, the younger generation into computer science and looks at a bigger picture of computer science than just Java, which is the AP computer science. And that's basically it. Uh, it is outlined in um, page two of the draft. Um, it gets from the basics of getting started, what is a computer, to more advanced things. It is also project, completely project-based, uh, online, um, and uh, the software comes from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, the curriculum, for the most part, um, comes from Trinity College and is one of the approved curriculums uh, by the College Board. Thank you. Any other comments, Dr. Boyce? No? Questions or comments from the board members? Mrs. Gerber. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I guess one question I had is, so is this an AP course or not? Because I know it says AP test optional. I just wasn't sure, like, what level course will it be? When we met with the uh, headmasters and housemasters, we debated whether we should offer it as an AP course or not. And, of course, students can take the AP exam without taking an AP designated course. And after much discussion, we, we decided as a group we would prefer not to offer it as an AP course as a beginning because we wanted to make sure that students were, were really um, going to sign up for it and not be turned away or, or discouraged by the AP designation. So our recommendation is that we offer it without the AP designation for now, uh, monitor it over the next year or so and see how the student response to it is and then determine whether we, in fact, want to make it um, into an AP designated course. But students can take it and still take the AP exam at the end of the course. Okay, and then another question I had, um, which you answered, is the only prerequisite is Algebra 1. So basically any grade could take this class as long as they've taken Algebra 1. That is correct, yes. Um, okay, and um, so I guess now, is this going to be for this coming school year? Uh, it's in the program of studies with the designation pending board approval. So um, if the board uh, approves it, it will be available to students who requested it in the fall. And have, has there been uh, like how, approximately how many requests? I know at Ward we have one, at least one class full uh, for the request. I'm not sure at Ludlow what the request is. We'll find out and get back. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Patton. Um, normal AP courses to take the exam, and most of the course preparation, because the exams are in early May, you know, take place during that time frame. Um, so, and according to your your uh, pacing guide, um, you know, you've got basically you know units seven and eight that might miss the boat on that. How would if a student let's say this coming year, even though it wasn't designated an AP class, if the student wanted to take the AP exam, would that student be prepared? And how does that work either now or going forward if the course designation changed? Uh, unit 7 uh, is an eight-week course, and it starts off around month so 7 or 8. It's sort of an optional unit for the AP exam, and as long as the same with uh, the last uh, programming task which is the uh, Create Programming Performance Test number two. 
Uh, the uniqueness of this course is all the students' work is posted on a Google site, and then that site is given to the college board uh, for review So in the summertime. So basically, they can work until the end of the school year, even though the test is a month or six weeks before the end of the school year. Um, so I'm confused a little bit. So OK, so normally the college boards would see that just the AP exam scores, correct? No, not in this case. So, uh, so whether this course was designated AP or not, this the college boards see the score of the test plus the work through the end of the school year. That is correct. That's um, my understanding of it. Yes. Okay, that's that's what's confusing. And that's at the student's option, I presume. That is correct. Yes. Uh, if the student has decided. Uh, we had discussed this with the house masters uh, to take the AP test. Then uh, I would make sure that they're, uh, as the AP computer science principal teacher, to make sure that their website is uh, set up, their portfolio on their website is set up as such to be presented to the college board for grading. Okay, and but again, back to my original question. So between the, the their website, the classwork that's online and presented to the college boards, and the exam itself. Would that information, would the student have all the information they needed to succeed in those tasks by the time the exam is administered? Yes. Okay. Other questions for uh, uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli? Um, all right, well, some, several of my questions already. At what point, I assume that the teachers themselves, or if teacher in this case, if it ends up being just the one section, because um, January is when they ask for that AP payment. Um, are they going to be encouraged even in year one if you see a student who seems to be you know nailing this that they would proactively because obviously the students did not sign probably most of them did not sign up thinking AP would they then be encouraged to do so or are you really going to take the first year of we really need to learn from this one before we foray into that I was going to pull aside uh, my higher scoring students that looked like they were on the ball basically and say you might this is an optional AP exam if you're interested in doing AP work. Okay. And then, of course, prep them that they would have to have a complete project done by the end of the, end of the school year uh, and the portfolio up to date. Okay. Um, and I also just want to clarify the nature of, this, of the curriculum. What are we having to write, or is it absolutely nothing? Has it been entirely, and we are just getting handed this course, um, I mean, not that you wouldn't have looked it over, and I, obviously the, I, all the, the way this is formatted, had to have been done by you, yes. but obviously we know summer curriculum work is going to be an issue for us this summer, but you're saying this is ready to hit the ground because everything is already done. All the it's projects done. done, the assessments already prepared. Uh, there are several schools in the area that are also offering this as an AP uh, course. Uh, New Canaan is one of them. Um, Jonathan Law, I went to visit a couple of years ago when this was uh, still in development. And I think Trumbull High School is using it. This, is their pet. this school year was the first year as an AP course. So I have a lot of colleagues in, outside the district uh, that have had reference to, that I can reference to, uh, as far as pacing, et cetera, et cetera. But if you didn't spend one hour this summer on curriculum work, this is ready to hit the ground running. I, I plan to spend my summer in Cape Cod. Yeah, outstanding, so. <laughs> outstanding. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, but I know you're going. I know you're going to be playing on some apps on that. Cause, so, um, okay, thank you. And I was wondering for the, um, the the middle school students who did take the coding class, is there any part of this then that's redundant, or this just so quickly accelerates past what that nine-week course did that? I believe it, it is it accelerates past it, but it's not as advanced as the current AP computer science uh, A course. Okay, how redundant is this going to be if a student took this and then said, wait a minute, this really is my interest. Now I want to take that AP computer science course. In other words, do you see one of the, one of the two getting phased out? No. Eventually, I mean, no, I, I know okay, that's putting the cart no, before the I'm horse, but. Be, this would, I'm assuming by the college board, this would at some top point and this is a big assumption by me, um, that uh, they would ha require this as one of the prerequisites for the AP Computer Science A. Okay. Class. Okay. That's been in place for years. Um, and then, well, you already answered my question about the staff and the budget, so um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Llewellyn. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, description here. I think I, the course looks like a great course. Uh, 
Could you share with the board a link to the actual curriculum since it's kind of out there already and been developed? The curriculum is on the Trinity website. Actually, it's, um, I know it's at the top of my head, it's mobile-cst. It's from Trinity. It's hosted by Trinity. Mobile-cst. Computer Science Principles. Dot dot org, you, I dot org. Perfect. Thank you. And that's the whole thing is just right at that link. Right there. Perfect. Uh, videos, everything uh, included. Uh, the software through MIT, you can download it right off of uh, the Trinity site. Uh, Trinity University site, and uh, uh, it's basically really nothing to even download. It's all just web-based. Uh, we use our Google accounts that's been approved by the, uh, the school system, uh, student Google accounts, uh, to log on, and students create separate accounts. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else? Uh, uh, Mrs. Lou McCormick, uh, do you want to follow up on that question? Um, sort of. But no, um, I'm fine Ms. with waiting. Lou McCormick, do you mind? Just out of curiosity, when, when kind of reading to... through the information you presented, it looks really interesting, but kind of skill-based. Are they actually going to learn how to write algorithms? Yeah. And so is this more of a kind of mathematical, like how to use, like being able to embed or nest stuff within Excel? Or are you actually teaching them, you're not teaching them a language, a coding language? In this case, we are. Oh, you are. Um, it, it, the, the course in itself, is not language bound. Um, the College Board gives teachers a lot of freedom and to choosing which language to, choose, to teach the course in. Uh, the App Inventor by MIT uh, and also Google, uh, which Google supports, um, is a GUI interface language. It's a drop and drag and drop uh, language. So you have uh, these blocks uh, on on the website and you just build the routines and. Um, I don't know if the board has heard of Hour of Coding, mm -hmm. um, the big program um, by all the world leaders of um, you know technology companies, but it's based off of that uh, those skills as well. It's like uh, Scratch. Yes, yeah, Scratch would be one of the um, coding uh, uh, IDEs that we can use as well. So then it will be what language the kids use is determined classroom by classroom, or is that going to be part of the curriculum as to? what we're going to use consistently across the district or how are you Unfortunately, it? Scratch had to be downloaded. You can't use that online. So I try to look for a all-inclusive online course and this one was one of the options that was allotted to me uh, through the college board. Okay. And so then the idea is by the end they should be able to put together what, what are they going to put together then? Uh, they have two major projects in which they have of their own creation. Um, so it's Apple app invention uh, projects or mobile apps. They use tablets or their phones if they want to, um, and whatever comes out of their mind that's PG-13 acceptable. Uh, that's the classroom requirement, uh, and uh, we, we go from there. Oh, so they could create a game or an app or whatever. Really, there's, there's no constraint. You're not teaching that they can take it in whatever direction. That is correct. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. This is Max and Kennelly. Uh, he answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from board members on this? If not, this will be on the agenda for vote and action at the next regular uh, board meeting. As uh, always, if you have questions that have occurred to you since, please uh, get to the staff so that they can either be ready at the board table or can answer your questions in advance. Thank you very much for bringing this course forward to us. Thank you. So now we are on item uh, eight, discussion of the 2017-18 budget. Um, uh, Dr. Jones will make some comments, but let me just outline to make sure that I hope the board is understanding that the approach that we're taking is to leave these items in the budget, not only because it uh, maintains a base of budget support, and if we don't maintain them in the budget, then we uh, end up having to get that money back the next year and every percent increase is difficult to get. And so therefore this is a list that is in front of you for discussion um, and uh, determine whether the board wants to say by consensus um, uh, we understand these items and leave it to management to manage it uh, over the summer and early fall based on what action the state takes or whether uh, you would want to do this by vote, which would be a little bit more constraining, if you will.
So, Dr. Jones, you want to make comments? Yeah, we don't actually have the Tier 1, Tier 2 in your packets, I don't believe, tonight. What, what you have in front of you is the one-page sheet um, that Ms. Munsell has put together for you just to show you basically where we are to help with the understanding. I think you know uh, that we don't know what's happening at the state level. So where our recommended budget um, at the top of the sheet started at 168757000 we had $2 million that was taken out, to, but it was 2033000 million And then when you look at the Board of Selectmen uh, at $2 million, where that actually was put back in at the Board of Finance, and then the RTM approved amount was 168724 So right now, if you look below that, when we approve the budget in June, we're only down that 33000 I think it's really important you know, to note that because we talk about lots of reductions that could be, but right now we really don't know what we don't know. Below that, the only other caveat that we know that's different than the last time we met is our pension is $129,000 higher uh, on the contribution than was budgeted in the approved budget. And uh, Ms. Bunsell, if you have questions for her, she certainly could answer that. But this is not, and I just want to kind of caution us to not let that look really scary. These sorts of number changes from the time we approve a budget until we get to September, there are going to be changes. We may need to hire two teachers because class sizes go up. Um, we may have a teacher that leaves and we don't need to replace the teacher, so it may be a positive. But these are just changes, making sure that you're aware of where we actually are. Down on the bottom, when you look at that 1718, it just gives you an idea of what Mr. Cullen um, has for you in maintenance accounts and projects. And he did provide the memo for you that gives you more specificity on that. And you can actually see what those items are that are just simply on hold. And that just means that we've had to make some thoughtful decisions uh, going into the summer. What do you do in July? What do you do in August? Maybe some of the projects we couldn't do anyway because we needed to go out to bid. They were going to take a little bit more time. This is really just, I, I feel like, a safety net for the board to know that we're being very thoughtful in central office trying to make sure that if we get a million dollar uh, reduction all of a sudden in you know, July that we're not anticipating because nobody knows what's happening, that we have already really identified after looking at you know, three pages of projects and accounts what are those projects that we're either not going to do this summer, that we could have done this summer, or we could have done them you know, later in the year, or what are those projects that we don't even have planned until the spring of 18 going into that June? And that just tells us, okay, this is, this is the easier number to look at for a safety cushion. This is really just keeping you informed that we're being proactive and trying to make sure that we're being very thoughtful and being prepared for the summer, not knowing really what's going to happen at the state level. Okay, uh, any uh, comments or discussion from the board uh, on the approach that we're taking or the uh, items uh, listed in the two handouts, one that was sent to you in the Friday packet and one that's in front of you tonight? Mrs. Gerber. Uh, yes, um, through the chair to Dr. Jones. Um, thank you for this information. I guess one question I have is, um, you know, when we got that kind of revised Tier 1, Tier 2 with the yellow and the orange, right. Is this, you know, because not everything that's on the, the memo that we got from Mr. Cullen last week is there are other things on here, like uh, the summer curriculum work, uh, professional development, allocation reduction, those things. Are those still up in the air? Are those? Those are still items that we would not anticipate that we would spend this summer in case we need them. Um, because we still right now, just with the two special education issues, there's still $2 million we really don't know. <coughs> That's not counting anything else that might flow through the town side um, that could, could have an impact for us. We just don't know. So those items are still what we would just consider they're frozen right now. It doesn't mean we're not necessarily going to do them, and we hope that we can. But again, it's just trying to be thoughtful, looking everywhere we can inside the budget to say we've at least identified this amount of uh, funding that we have on hold going into June and July just so that we are not in shock in July if we have a $2 million hole and we're scrambling trying to fix it because you've already done all these projects and put things in motion that you can't undo. Okay, and then I guess the other question, too, because you had like the 2P position, the bus reduction, so are those yes. still happening? 
Yes. So I, I will say on the PE that that one is actually a 0.5 at each high school. They actually looked at their entire master schedule, and instead of having to take both of those from the PE department, they did a 0.5 and a 0.5 from each high school, and then they had some other areas that so it's the same dollar amount, okay. but where they didn't need the sections for another area. Can, can I for a minute? Uh, okay, I have so, another question. So um, perhaps in June, uh, this page highlights the maintenance accounts that are on hold, but um, uh, we should add the other accounts that are listed on in yellow to this page so there's a complete list of everything that you're on hold. Am I stating this correctly? That's correct. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and then I guess another question I had, because and you actually mentioned, you know, that we may have to add staff, um, you know, with class sections. and. I just was wondering if you could um, give us a sense on the elementary level of where we are now, you know, because there, there were quite a few. I mean, I went through the budget book, and there are quite a few that were within just a few students of needing an additional section in elementary school. I mean, some schools have like two or three grades that might need an additional section. And I was just wondering how that kind of plays into all of these numbers here. And, and I'm also, forgive me, I can't remember. At what point is kind of like the drop dead point by which you do have to determine how many sections you're having? Is it August 1st or just, I, I just, I, I can't quite remember exactly when that fell, but I guess just, you know, where are we now? Are there any classes that have actually that will need an additional section that we already know of? Or are there some that, you know, because I know when you built the budget, you know, we've had more students come into elementary school. So are we now at any school already over that, whatever that threshold is to needing another section? Or are we headed? in that direction? And if so, how many sections are we looking at? Yeah, it is still too early to actually look at that. We knew going into the budget there were 13 sections where you were one or two students from going up or down. Um, and until we actually get into the summer, we, we don't make those decisions. And one thing we will do this year is be incredibly thoughtful before school starts and really make sure that if we think we have 22 children in a class, we're going to have to confirm with all 22 of those families that they are indeed still here. And, and that can happen right up until when school gets ready to start, as long as we feel like we can still hire a great teacher for the children. Okay. Well, I guess so, just to kind of piggyback on that. So if we know, though, at some point between now and, say, August 1st, that we do have a class, a kindergarten class, say, that has 24 students, or if we know that we have a fourth grade class or a third grade class that has 26 students, will there be an additional teacher hired like we're not are we are we going to continue to make sure that we stay within those board of ed guidelines i know it's not a policy per se but it's been something that you know the board and, and i think the district and parents kind of expect so you know i just think it's important that if we think that we may end up in a position where we would have classes going over and i understand once you get into the school year if students come in sometimes you do end up going over that threshold that 23 or 25 threshold but between now and august 1st can we assure parents that we're not going to go over that number? I think when we know more about the budget, I think that's going to be a discussion for the board because what we have traditionally done is if we have 22, 22, 22, and one student moves in, we add a full section for one class of 23. What most districts would do is you would have the one over, you'd have 23, 23, 23, and then you would add the section. And that's a different way of looking at it, and it really, you know, obviously has huge budgetary implications. And, you know, it isn't, like you say, policy-driven, because our policy is actually quite large. So that will be something going into the fall. We, I have to, you know, see if the board, in fact, is comfortable with that. Instead of one child over on a grade level, we're going to add a full teacher position. Or is it each section on a third grade needs to be one over, and then that's when you add the teacher. Okay, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, because we're kind of running out of time because we don't meet in July, right. and so we've got two meetings in June, basically, and then b by the time we come back, it's the end of August, so whatever decisions are made have been made. So I just think it's really important that if this is something that you or the administration is going to be suggesting that we actually do look at these numbers and maybe, you know, are asked to be flexible with them, I think it's really important that, you know, the public understands that because, it would be a shame to come back and have a number of classes that are, you know, 26, you know, kids that, you know, we, we were assuming that, you know, because we always discuss class size always comes up during the budget. And it's something that, you know, as long as I've been coming to Board of Ed meetings, you know, it's come up sometimes as a possibility, well, we may have to look at that. And there's been a lot of pushback, both from board members, from, from parents and whatnot. And so I'm just concerned that 
you know, people are going to go away for the summer and think that we're in one place and they're going to come back and we're going to have these large class sizes. And again, once the school year starts, I get, you know, we could end up even with 27 kids in a class because you have, you know, we had 26 elementary students move in throughout the course of the year. So if we we're already starting over, then we could have even bigger class sizes, which I think would be problematic, at least personally. I'm just speaking for myself. So. Other questions from board members on this? Mrs. Maxson Kennelly. <coughs> Just a couple of uh, brief ones, um, and I apologize that I can't do this off the top of my head, but the, um, I don't know, Dr. Jones, if you know this or if Mr. Colin A. he is, um, whenever I see roofing, that gets my attention. I just can't remember what this, and it's only 10,000, I just can't remember what roofing is in reference to, and I never like thinking that we're not doing roofing work, so that if it's been identified as a need, so I was wondering about that. I don't think I have to remind you to state your name and position. Yes. For the record, Tom Cullen, Director of Operations. Uh, I'm glad you picked this one because this is good news. Uh, the Roofing Preventive Maintenance Program we've been doing for over 10 years. We're starting to get feedback from the contractors that we're doing very well. Our roofs are in good shape. We probably could look at a reduction moving forward of about 10 or 15,000. So we put 10,000 on the. So this isn't a project being held off. No. This is it's not needed. Correct. Ah, very good. Um, and then, likewise, the Hazardous Materials Project. Never like to think we're skimping on taking care of hazardous materials. This account is used for areas that could pop up during the year uh, where a vinyl asbestos tile is in a classroom or in a teacher's office uh, that maybe gets cracked or crumbling and we have to go investigate it. So this would not be something that, it, it, the, the waiting over the summer, this isn't a summer project then that's being held. No. This is something over the course of the year so if we don't get the huge hit that we're trying to prepare for, that money would then still be there and it would be used and it's fine during the school year. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then for the projects themselves, um, I was wondering if there's any particular project that was especially near and dear to you because you know of the whole tough state it's in. Um, I know, again, having, having seen that Ludlow parking <laughs> lot, it really, all, all, obviously all of them, but you know, is, is there, are there any that would be able yeah. to, all right, let me change the question. Yeah. Are there any that can be done during the school year so that if the summer hit is not that full amount, we will, because again, talk about the phrase kicking the can down the road. These are just going to need to be added to the next budget. They're not going away. So which of these, if the money is there, will be able to be done while the school is in session? Uh, probably only one, the Fairfield Ward High School Naps Highway Tennis Courts. All the others are going to require uh, engineering or architectural drawings going out to bid, hazardous material cleanup, uh, indoor air quality testing, all that kind of stuff. But they are all dear to my heart. I should have They're known better than to phrase it that one. way. Um, okay, thank you. I will say that, Mr. Collin, no matter which board member asked you to, about if they're all important, uh, you have consistently said they're all important. <laughs> yes, I keep a running list in my office of one, twos, and threes. The ones make yes. the list on the board. Other yes. questions from board members on this list, recognizing that this list plus essentially the ones in yellow that are not listed here will form the total list. Mr. Llewellyn. Perfect. Actually, first questions for Mr. Cullen while we have you. Uh, you've got $100,000 here for paving and sidewalk and curbs. My question about the curbs. I think uh, this year they did an especially good job of knocking them out of the parking lots. Uh, yes. Does the contractor pay to reinstall everything he knocked out? Or, yes, they uh, do. They have to go around and pick up all the broken curbs and ones that are spread out in the field. I know. Uh, they they damaged the light pole at Riverfield, and they damaged a couple signs. We went over and gave them a whole list. They've been picking up all the damaged material, and they do have to reinstall the new. Okay, perfect. This account is 150000 right now. We were holding 100 on the side. Okay, perfect. I, I was curious about who paid for the damage. Yeah. Um, we're very they diligent with that. Extensive. I did like the way they got well into the fields, though, when they threw it. Nope, they did last year, too. They did a great job cleaning up and, and replacing it all. 870 lineal feet of curbing they destroyed. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess my, my next question is about the process. And uh, Mr. Dwyer, you had mentioned you know, were we going to kind of vote line by line or were we going to kind of do it on consent? And I'm not even sure what, your qu what question you're asking um, because I have a sheet of paper here that 
doesn't have the details behind it that were provided today in the last meeting. So what, what, what specifically are you asking of the board, please? Uh, so uh, if you take the uh, sheet that has all the yellow on it. And that's where? It was handed out at the last two several meetings, but okay. the last but it's not here today. Yeah. Okay. We will take those items from that are in yellow that are not listed on here and add them to this list. So that at the June meeting when you vote or you accept, depending on which the board wishes to do, the total list of items that will be on hold for next year will be shown to you. Okay? Um, then, uh, under, I'll say, normal circumstances, when the superintendent tells us that there are some shortfalls and that they have to place a hold on certain expenses, in order to ensure that we balance our budget, uh, the superintendent provides that list to us. We thank them, we accept the list by consensus, and we don't necessarily vote on it because we consider that to be one of management's function to balance the budget if there are shortfalls. So the suggestion is that we follow that same process, thank you for the list, um, and allow the superintendent to manage that list based on what she hears from the state. Uh, and if she has to greatly differ from that list, she'll update it, I'm sure, in August or however long, because that's also a normal process that when we're facing a deficit, the sheet is updated on a regular basis so that we're aware of what decisions are being made. Uh, on the alternative, if the board wanted to, we could vote this, the lit, not this particular list, but the one I described that will include all of the items in yellow, uh, we could vote that at the next meeting, but then that would more constrict the superintendent mm -hmm. to only use that list and if found savings someplace else naturally that would allow her to release some funds, she'd have to get board action on it. So Mr. Llewellyn, as you might imagine, um, I am always in favor of giving flexibility to management to uh, manage the budget mm -hmm. uh, because they're paid to do that and we're not. And does that help you understand the process? It does, and you're going to be looking for our input on that question at the yes. next meeting, not at this meeting. Yeah. At the next meeting, um, when, when we have it in front of us. And I guess my request is, and I've asked this a couple of times, that as we go through things that are handed out in prior meetings, can we always have 100% of the attachments at the table? So if we happen to grab the wrong folder, we actually have a reference to what's in there. For a while, I carried six inches of paper with me from all past files. But if, if we're going to be referencing something off of another, it's another couple sheets of paper. It doesn't need to be in color, but um, I don't like referencing things from past meetings that I may or may not have in front of me. I understand our, our practice, I know, and I'm I don't asking, like to hear this, but our practice is to not waste paper and make duplicate copies of things that we've already given to board members. So we, we do not duplicate the policies that we're voting on a second time. We don't duplicate the curriculum documents that, oh, that are not along right. a second time. So, so. Um, and I guess our practice should be to vote on a fully informed basis. So, if we could have copies of the shorter things in front of us, it would be yes. appreciated. And and you are fully informed because you've been given it to in yep. past meetings. And it depends on whether this board wanted to uh, kill some more trees. Okay, and I guess this will be through the chair to uh, the superintendent. If if you could please see that we have copies of especially financial type information from prior meetings that we'll be expected to discuss, that it's available, that'd be great. I understand Phil's past practice. The board's past practice. Mr. That's Llewellyn, that's the, the board's past practice. Step by the chair, you're right. Not the superintendent's, it's been the board's past practice. Um, any other questions on this list? Um, per Mr. Llewellyn's uh, earlier comment, um, uh, is there any comments that people wish to make regarding whether we will uh, accept this by consensus uh, or whether the board will want to vote on this list at the next meeting? Recognizing the only other budget, budget vote that will be required is eventually a recommendation on what to do with that 33000 It's a fairly small amount, but it will have to be actually acted upon so that our budget number matches the town's approved budget number. Mr. Asa. So if we were to vote, as you say, would that mean that the superintendent would have to come back to the board to make any changes or, or adjustments to that? Uh, yes, that would mean my interpretation would be that these items are on hold 
and if um, uh, if she found savings in some other area for whatever purpose then uh, and wanted to take this off um, and pick some item I think that would have to come back to the board for a vote anytime the board votes on something and it changes substantially I think the board is owed an opportunity to revote if you will and if we left it and accepted it as you mentioned Dr. Jones would have the discretion and the, I guess, management aspect to handle it. Yeah, within, within reason, it would probably not be wise for the superintendent to change the entire list and start working on another list without informing the board. Okay. You know, so it gives her some discretion, but not total, you know, okay. carte blanche. You. Mrs. Maxson can all you. Um, and I, I don't know if this uh, would help Mr. Say, but so the notion be, say if, uh, okay, ridiculous example but out of the blue we have 15 fewer elementary school sections than we budgeted for that's suddenly money in play that would mean that something that was on that list now would not have to be sacrificed and that decision could be made in central office and not have to come back to a board that that money then would be available for her discretion um, my only question is regarding in, in general I would defer to the um, management of Dr. Jones um, However, one thing that I am curious about is what we're looking at for this 33,000. Um, for example, and I know it's not a, the largest of numbers, um, but I was very keen as one example of, I want to see some recognition that we will be seeing um, energy savings with the solar. That that, is, that was not money that was counted on when we approved the budget. It is money that we will be saving, um, even estimating conservatively. So, if I knew something like that was going to be factored into the 33,000, that's one thing. If it, if it were not, um, then that maybe would put something else um, that, that was in yellow. No, we can go ahead with that. You know, maybe there's some small aspect of curriculum work that, you know what, this would really be near and dear. We'd like to do something with this with elementary school math, and that gives us $5,000 to do it, as an example. Um, so I would be, uh, so to Mr. Dwyer's point, I'm, I'm not saying that, I necessarily want to make it a voting item. I might, however, question some of the items on the list um, just to really be sure of exactly what the impact is going to be for instruction, uh, for the programming, and what have you. Um, we've had some discussion, but now it's obviously real, um, and, and we'll be making that determination. We're ready to go off into the summer. So that's the aspect of the conversation I'm still interested in. Uh, pursuing, although I, I, I don't think that the idea of turning this into an actual vote is something that would be in our best interest. Other comments on vote versus accept by uh, consensus, if you will? This is Lou McCormick. Okay, you had other comments that you wanted to make. Can I stay on that so that we might, get, the chair might get an understanding as whether to put this on as an action item or not? Mr. Patton, do you have any thought on that? No, I think it's it's sounds safe to leave the amount at the discretion of the staff or in the superintendent because um, we don't know I mean it, that's, that's the bottom line is we really just don't know to, to so to make to take action next month to say we're going to remove this this and this from the budget you know that has other implications for future budgets and, and whatnot so I'm not really willing to take those kind of risks I think it's safer to have some leeway I shouldn't have put you on the spot. Any other board members wish to make a comment on this question? This is Ms. Pitko. I think as part of the superintendent's import, it's understanding to accept it. My concern would be whether more money would have, more funding would have to be taken from somewhere. Then I think it should be brought back to the board. So, for instance, in July, when we don't meet, all of a sudden the state takes more money from us. I think that we absolutely should have a say in that, whether it's a vote or the superintendent's support or discussion. I will say that our past practice has been that when we're facing a major shortfall, that the superintendent either at each meeting or at each uh, second meeting of the month where the prior month's activities are known, that they update the list so that on a month, at least a monthly basis, we'll get a list of what is on the hold pattern and what has been taken off, what has been added if necessary because of um, uh, the negative thinking that Ms. Pitko might have on what the state might do. Um, so I think the board should expect that we'll be seeing this list on a monthly basis 
especially for the first half of the year. Uh, other board members that wish to make, can I get a comment on other board members that want to make a comment about uh, management versus a vote at the next meeting? Uh, Mrs. Gerber. Um, I mean, I'm kind of torn because on the one hand, you know, I feel like one of the board's responsibilities is to vote. And so, but I realize that this year we're under extreme um, circumstances. But I guess just to go back to the, you know, my concern is, you know, I know you said we'll get updates throughout the course of the, uh, the school year if, if more, you know, reductions are needed. But just to come back to, since I brought it up, you know, the whole class size thing, that's a decision that will have to be made in July, I'm assuming, or in early August. And I'm just concerned that, you know, I, I guess it would just be nice to know that if, if there's going to be a change in class size, you know, in the, the Board of Ed not policy, but Board of Ed recommendations, I just, I think it would be helpful for the board to know that. At least personally, I would. I don't know if the rest of the board feels the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the public's benefit, uh, because it sounds like the superintendent is looking at a modification of how they approach judging that extra one or two or three students, it probably makes sense to put that on as a discussion item at the next board meeting so that at least the public can see it on the agenda and be able to make a comment on it as well as the board could make a comment on it. Mrs. Lou McCormick. So if I look at both these sheets, I just want to make sure. So right now we have basically from the yellow and this sheet, we have approximately up to a little over two million earmarked in the event that we need it. Is Inclusive that right? of the maintenance items that are shown here. Inclusive, all together. So yeah, that's an all aggregate. together it's about two million. So to the extent that the need should be higher than that as Ms. Pitko referenced, it would by default come back to the board for further discussion? Yes. Is that currently how yeah. we have it envisioned, right? Yeah. And then if it should fall short, then it would go back by the tiers. So you would naturally go through, as we discussed, kind of move up the line like this if the amount were less than two million. Some of the, I think some of the tier items, it might be past a point of no return that even if they wanted to, you couldn't implement it. Oh, so I'm not sure decided. that we would follow the tiers exactly. That might be, not be possible. Not without looking at each item, you know, there are some items that just time goes past and it's too late to you know. So can we understand what those items are that have already been, basically the time has gone so they're not going to happen regardless? Do, is that, has that been itemized? Is that on this? Yeah. yeah. So all the yellows are ready, they're just not going to happen? Right. Okay, I see. All right. So then um, I guess I am fine with it being at the discretion so long as it's within that amount, but if it was over that amount, I would hope that it would be returned to the board for further discussion. And I assume the board is uh, saying that if it's over that amount, but if it's over by 25000 on a $2 million list, just having it listed there, <laughs> fine. It's, it's, we're really talking uh, if it's over by a material amount. Can I respond to that? Yeah. I, I, I don't know that I agree with that because I think that, you know, if it's $25,000, I think if it's a particular program that's being cut, or being considered, I think we want to discuss it. I think that no matter what the amount is, if it hasn't made one of the lists that it's been addressed, that it should be brought back at least for presentation and discussion and comment because, yeah. you know, some of these programs yeah. are small, but they're important. There's no fair comment. If, if the aquatics program was on there for 40, I'm sure that there would be board members that would comment on it. Yes. Other comments, uh, it doesn't appear at the moment that there's, that you, I need to put this on for action. That does not mean if you change your mind for the June meeting that it couldn't be added to the agenda because it is a regular meeting and added as a vote. But at the moment, uh, I'll not put it on for action. Mr. Llewellyn, you want to make a final comment? I did. Thank you. Um, you know, to follow up on a couple of things that were said, Ms. Pitko made a, a good comment that if we have any cuts from the state, you know, that should probably come to this board if, in fact, it's going to impact, as Ms. Lou McCormick just said, any educational programs. You know, if we're going to cut uh, you know, funding to the curbs, you know, that's one thing. If we're going to be touching any educational aspect, I think it needs to come to the board. Yeah, clearly. Um, well, right. So, I, you know, I'm not sure we're in a position to say whether or not we 
or, or how this is shaped. So we should probably think about that between now and the next meeting. Um, maybe it's 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 with you know with just consent, but uh, you know predicated on a couple of things like that. Other comments that people wish to make. This is a discussion item, so no action is expected tonight. Uh, perhaps the sooner you can uh, suggest where uh, Mr. Cullen is going to donate that extra thirty-three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> no, where the thirty-three thousand? Probably the sooner you get that information to the board, the uh, the better it off we would be. Um, if there are no further comments, do you have any final comments? Where's Ms. Pitko? And then Dr. Jones will make final comments. I don't know who the, who the chair to who this goes to, Jessica or Dr. Jones. I, I agree with Jessica. I, I think we need some clarification about um, what will happen if we get one extra student past class size. Class size is a huge issue to me as a teacher. So I, I really, yeah, that, that uh, as you might recall, budgetary concerns, I, I want to know about these yeah, things. As you might recall, I said that we should add that to the agenda, not only so that the board can clearly understand it, but so that the public would have an opportunity to comment on it if they so wished. Any other final comments? If none, thank you very much. I thought we had a good discussion. We are now up to item <laughs> C on uh, number seven, and that's first reading of a policy. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, uh, this one comes with a little bit of urgency, not that I see the board having an issue with this, um, that this has to be taken care of by the end of the month because uh, the FBI has notified um, districts that there uh, is an audit impending and this is something that we have to have in place and that's what prompted this one to come before the policy committee. And you, know, you could see the language that had been there as well as what was added and so as always, uh, questions or edits or tweaks or comma questions or anything um, I would appreciate in advance of the next meeting because uh, we do have a policy meeting prior to our, our next board meeting when we'll be voting on this and so if it's not something I can address or that I want to throw out to the committee um, then I would have the opportunity to do so any questions on this policy at the moment? This is Mr. Llewellyn. I was on a roll on the train on the way home here, so I've got comments on this one for you now, too. Um, if we look at the one, two, three, fourth paragraph, it says district employees shall, within 30 days after the hire, submit to state national criminal checks. I think that needs to read along the lines of prior to being hired, district employees shall submit to the state national and criminal checks. They're, they're, they're giving their permission. Whether or not the district does it, that's a different discussion. But they shouldn't be able to withhold their approval for a background check uh, until after they're hired. I mean, they need to um, leave that up front. i only say this, if I may. Um, uh, Anne is on vacation today, but um, my guess is she would stand up and say, uh, gathering criminal background information on an employee prior to hiring is probably not acceptable. You have to make the hiring decision and then do the background check, understanding that if it doesn't come through correctly, they don't have the job. So that, that we, we can get clarification on that, but that might be an issue. Well, the word that I read here is, it says submit to. Uh, I think submit means uh, not have it actually done, but consent. So maybe the word submit needs to be consent. So prior to being hired, district employees shall consent to a background check. It doesn't mean we have to do it until after the offer, so we can stay within that. Uh, but I think uh, you know, letting s somebody who may have a uh, very checkered background work for 30 days prior to having to consent to a background check is a little odd. Um, the other question I have on here is if I look at the title, it says security check and fingerprinting. I don't see fingerprinting mentioned in this. So we, we, you know, we're consenting, but unless I'm missing a page, which I could be. Um, part of the but it doesn't, I mean, I it doesn't say it anywhere. They need to consent to a background check and fingerprinting. I know the fingerprinting is what does it, but, or we can strike fingerprinting from the top, but I know. That's why, that's, that's exactly right. That's why I think it needs to say here they need to consent to fingerprints to be done by the police department, to be done by an outside agency, to be done by well, the committee will take that under advisement. Any other comments that people might wish to make? If not, this will be on the agenda for action at the next meeting. Um, 
On to uh, item number eight, approval of minutes. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the regular meeting of May 9th, 2017. Mrs. Grover moves. Ms. Pitko seconds. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes? Seeing none, um, the motion is in front of you to approve the minutes of the May 9th meeting. All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Patton, Mr. Gerber, Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Pitko, uh, Mr. Acer, Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, opposed? Mrs. Lou McCormick, Mr. Welland, the uh, motion passes six to two. Uh, yes, six to two. Um, and also for clarification, while uh, it has been common for board members not to vote on minutes that they haven't been at the meeting, uh, while that might be a custom, Robert's Rules does allow board members to vote on minutes, and so Mr. Acer correctly uh, votes. The superintendent's report. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I did have the opportunity to go to the Ludlow High School Family Consumer Science Fashion Show that uh, Catherine mentioned tonight. Absolutely fabulous, and if it's when it's on next year, I'd encourage you uh, to go. It was everything from modeling their own clothes to the food that the students cooked um, and watching the little preschoolers in the early childhood program model the clothes uh, was fabulous. I've also been to a lot of our art shows, um, music concerts over the last few weeks and just amazed at really the art shows are unbelievable how much time and effort goes in to really just transform their school environments um, into these fabulous shows and the same way with the concerts. I've just been so impressed. Um, I also, tonight I had um, it had some exchanges with our chair and also with our secretary about four early release days that are on the calendar that were put on there for professional development purposes for early release. They don't statutorily change the calendar in regards to the days students meet um, or anything of that nature, but it was advised that we go ahead and bring this to the board just for you to be able to have for consideration and go ahead and take a vote on it in June because there may or may not be support for that. The staff feel like it's something that can really be of a benefit to us. Gaining eight hours of professional development is, is wonderful, especially when you can do it with your entire teaching staff and we are desperately in need of that right now. Understand that for some parents, for additional early releases, it can be a pain but also giving the budget. If you just quantify being able to have those eight hours for that many staff members, that's well over $200,000 in professional development that we're able to get at no cost for our staff. And I you know, commend our whole senior, senior team in that we're trying to be as creative with, as we can. Um, and same when if you go back to the tiers and this other list, we are really trying to be thoughtful going into what we believe is going to be a very difficult budget year and look at every avenue that we can um, to have cost savings and that benefit teachers and children. And um, Dr. Boyce and Mr. Cummings are, are here tonight and happy to speak to um, the value in that. Yes, if you'd like to come forward. Good evening, Mike Cummings, Director of Elementary Education. Uh, as Dr. Jones said, uh, we put a lot of time and thought into this uh, proposal. Our concern is, given the current budget times and uh, certainly the projected budget uh, that we're going to be faced with, um, we still face uh, the fundamental need to continually to invest in our, the training of our staff. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, in order to, that they are able to provide the best instruction for the students. <coughs> excuse me. So. We look at this as a necessary investment in that work. Um, I can tell you, for example, just uh, at the elementary level next year as we implement uh, social studies in 3-5, we would look to um, provide, uh, use those half days to train the teachers in the upcoming units. Um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, currently we're not able to do that, or if we're able to do that at best, it's uh, splintered over the 11 schools. Uh, an early release day gives us the opportunity to bring each grade level together. Um, and train them together, uh, build their collaboration around the work that's going in place, allow them to share resources and materials and ideas in the implementation of the new units. 
Um, that's just one example of the work that we would um, set out to do. Um, given these times, or given this, uh, these additional times, I will tell you that our commitment is to provide the highest quality to make sure that the teacher's time in that PD um, is well spent. Um, those, are the, those are the things that we need to have in place. Um, we'll also work with our staff to make sure that um, our, our, the staff who provide the professional development to make sure that they are um, working with the uh, um, appropriate uh, expectations for adult learning. I don't know if there's any questions or thoughts about this. Dr. Dr. Boyce, do you wish to make a comment and then we'll go into questions? Dr. Meg Boyce, Director of Secondary Ed, I'd just like to add that, as you may know, it, it's been very hard for those of us in the instructional office to give up summer work. Our curriculum leaders and liaisons and coordinators spend hours every summer working with teachers, not only in the creation of curriculum, but also after the board approves the curriculum in writing um, assessments, lesson plans, um, all the things that go into the implementation of the curriculum, and we worked really hard at ensuring a consistent delivery of, of the curriculum across classrooms and across schools. So these four early release dates will help us gain back some time. It's, it's not an even exchange. And so looking forward, I really hope the time will come when we can bring back this important summer work. Dr. Puglise is still working on implementation of the social studies curriculum that you approved last year. That was a huge undertaking. First K-12 curriculum we approved and it takes a lot of work to do the next stage and, and get, it, get it fully written and implemented um, with all of the assessments and lesson planning that goes with it. So um, I think these four early release days are important. Um, and it's a, as I said, it's, it's a way to somewhat make up for the loss of time this summer. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, board members, the uh, revised calendar as proposed is in front of you and they include little triangles around the dates that are early dismissal. Could you highlight for us the four that are being changed to early dismissal so that we, it's easier for yes. us to know? Yes, um, those four dates are December 12th, January 30th, March 13th, and May 22nd. March what? Uh, March 13th. 13th and? May 22nd. May. 20 seconds. Thank you. Questions from board members. Mrs. Gerber. Also, there's one additional one um, for middle school and high school because uh, the past few years, the Thursday before President's Day weekend has been early dismissal for elementary only, but now it's for all levels, so that would also be new for middle school and high school. So that is Thursday, the 15th of February is also an additional, that's new for high school and middle school, but not for elementary school. Any other comments from board members? Mrs. Lou McCormick. My, my question, I guess, would be regarding the May 22nd date. It is set so late in the year. Professional development benefits that would be able to be practiced after that might be somewhat limited. So I'm wondering if it would be possible to move the professional development up earlier in the year. Generally, I would agree with you, but I, I know that um, Dr. Rasmussen and Mr. Chapet are just finishing an analysis of the SAT data, for example, and they just they've just downloaded it into spreadsheets by teacher with a very intricate array of data for teachers to look at, and that we don't get that until the end of May. So there are things such as that um, that we can use that time for, and it's. It, it would be in, invaluable for teachers to have that information while they still have the students and before they leave for the summer. So I can assure you there, there are many things we can do. And professional development, I think, needs to be thought of broadly. It's not just training teachers about what to do in the classroom, but it's also giving teachers time to look at data and analysis and, and reflect back on their teaching and think about what they would change in the future um, as well. So I, I believe a May date would be uh, valuable to us. Uh, Ms. Pitko. I, I just want to also comment on your question. So in May 22nd, I would be meeting with my other colleagues and to talk about maybe their final. How are we going to, we're, we're moving to a, like a mastery based learning. So how would we get together to create a common final for them? That would be really important to me. I moved from a middle school to a high school model and middle school there's there's plenty of common planning time. In high school, there's not so much of that. 
So it's really important to have like these professional learning communities and there's a tremendous reward in meeting with your colleagues and talking about your practice and learning from them or learning from somebody outside of the district. When I did my masters, I looked at other countries and for instance, a company, countries like Japan, they have half days every Wednesday so that the teachers can reflect on their practice. Other comments, Mrs. Maxim Kelly? Um, a, a slightly more radical proposal because I completely, I, I'm very uh, not, I'm not happy with what we're losing this summer. Um, I recognize, you know, that the budget implications are what they are, but I know what can happen in a summer that simply can't happen in a school year. Um, and I recognize all the new curricula that we are throwing at these teachers and they have to be prepared, but the materials have to be prepared in order to prepare them. And that's all um, up in the air right now. So here's what I'm asking. What if we took three of these, restored them to full day, and instead took off October 9th as a school day, made that a full day of professional development, and changed the end of school to June 13th. What you don't run into in that case is that's a day where a lot of parents would not be working because it's Columbus Day. And if that became instead, right now everyone expects it to be school, it would not be different for staff. But if that became a full day of professional development, no school for children, the school year extended one day and take off three of the half days of professional development and instead cover it on that, it puts it earlier in the school year, is therefore more beneficial for many of those aspects of curriculum in terms of training, instruction, or evaluation, summer AP results, whatever, however the different levels were going to use it. Um, but it's, it also t alleviates the issue of how this is absolutely impacting parents with young children. Um, where you have these half days and now what do you do with them and, and people are working and so just wanted to throw that out there as an idea of something to consider. Well this is good discussion and the staff will take all of the suggestions to heart and then come back with a final proposal. Mr. Llewellyn. Just to follow up on that question um, or comment, my question is how many days are uh, in the CBA for the staff, the teaching staff and it, I think we've got how many? That's for to teach, but how many days are in the contract to work? I believe it's 187. So we've got room there to do that if we wanted to? Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from the board? Uh, Mr. Patton? Um, Ms. Maxim Canelli and I were on the same page, and I was going to do a similar kind of thing, but instead of removing that extra four half days, I was just going to say, why don't we swap the half day on October 11th for the 9th on Columbus Day and make Columbus Day a full day. So you'd... Oh, that's SATs. So we have to have that anyways. Okay. Well, either way, I was thinking Columbus Day, the same, the same thing, um, because that would still give us all that extra and get us back a little bit towards the beginning of the year of what we lost for the summer. And regardless of what happens, hopefully this won't be cut again for next summer. And I would still like to see whatever is approved for this calendar year for the extra professional development uh, held even with the summer professional development. Does that make sense? So I'm all for more professional development, if you couldn't tell. Any other uh, comments or suggestions? Seeing none, uh, we will put this on as an action item uh, because the past practice has been to approve the calendar and therefore changes to it should also be approved. So this will be on as an action item at the uh, first meeting in June. Um, my suggestion is take these items under consideration, uh, uh, get this to the board members in advance for the packet so that if board members have any questions as to whether their idea is being recommended or not, you might be able to go offline to ask uh, the staff some more detail as to what their thinking was, which might save us time uh, at the June meeting. Uh, we're up to any other, anything else on superintendent's report? Okay, we're up to committee and liaison reports. Let me uh, just say that we have a new board member um, and uh, that uh, caused some changes to committee and liaison report. Uh, uh, Ms. Pitko has agreed to go into policy uh, to uh, ensure that that committee has three people. Um, um, I am the liaison to the Holland Hill Building Committee. Uh, Mr. Acer is actually a voting member of that committee uh, because the 
board, uh, the town guidelines do not allow a board of education member to be a voting member of the building, of any building committee. Um, I will step down as the liaison to the Holland Hill Building Committee, and Mr. Asa has agreed to continue to serve as the liaison to the Holland Hill Building Committee. All of these appointments are good until November when we review appointments anyways, and then if Mr. Acer is uh, wishing to get off of the Holland Hill Building Committee, he'll let that be known, and if not, he's serving for life. Um, <laughs> he, is, he is also uh, going to replace uh, Anthony Calabrese as a member of the Transportation Safety Board that doesn't meet on a regular basis, but does, advisory board, but does meet uh, as needed as parents might make uh, requests for consideration of a change in bus stop. Any other comments on committee and liaison reports that people wish to make? Mrs. Gerber. Just an update on Osborne Hill. Uh, the building committee met last week and they did have bids for uh, fencing. Um, and uh, so they are moving ahead with that and the plan is to have the fencing installed over the summer. Any other comments on committee or liaison reports? Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, two, first I would uh, like to personally thank Ms. Pitko for being willing to come on board while Ms. Carnell and I were willing to uh, do it alone, go it alone. It's a lot easier with uh, another set of eyes uh, there in policy. Um, so that first, and second, I just want to extend an invitation to the full board uh, because we won't meet again prior to this event happening, but on Thursday, and I'll probably send an email as well, but on Thursday, June 8th, uh, PTA Council will be sponsoring their annual awards uh, where we recognize three um, active members of the community for their various levels of PTA involvement, as well as we recognize several staff members with the Brian Fagan Award, um, which comes with a grant. And that will take place on Thursday, June 8th at 7 o'clock at Tomlinson. Uh, there in the auditorium. It's just, it's a really nice event. Um, also comes with some nice food, but it's a very nice event. Um, some well-deserved recognition uh, for some of our hardworking uh, PTA volunteers. And so it'd be wonderful to see some board members there and of course, um, members of the public. Any other comments on committee liaison reports? Uh, on Holland Hill, uh, as my last liaison report, but Mr. Asa may want to uh, elaborate. Um, the uh, building committee feels it is on schedule to get all of the votes that they need through the Board of Selectmen, uh, Board of Finance, and RTM so that we can file by June 30 and be uh, included in the reimbursement rate um, that will be in effect until July 1. Uh, so that's good news. Um, they're uh, uh, reviewing bids at the moment and uh, have some reasonable confidence that that the, with some negotiation, the bids will be satisfactory. Uh, the heads of each of those groups um, are uh, prepared to take action. Uh, so because they are as interested in us qualifying under the old rules for reimbursement as we are. So uh, that's the status of that, unless Mr. Asa wishes to expand on it. No, I think <clears throat> there is a meeting this coming Thursday uh, where we should be reviewing numbers and getting more details um, at that point. So um, right now I believe May 31st is when it's supposed to go to the Board of Selectmen at a special meeting that's been scheduled um, for a vote. Okay, if there's no other comments, uh, this is the time where we go to the public if they open board comment. Thank you again. Any member of the board have any open board comments? Mr. Patton. In light of all the Hoopla going around uh, at the state level with um, with the budget. Um, I'd like to at least have a discussion, maybe at the next meeting, um, to possibly have a July meeting at some point. I don't know about swapping it for the August meeting because I know usually we want a meeting before the beginning of the school year. But um, I just think that there's too much stuff going on that you know maybe by the time the June meeting comes, we'll have more information and we might want to consider that. Thank you. Any other open board comments? Mrs. Gerber. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I was very lucky yesterday um, to uh, pinch it for Mr. Dwyer at the uh, Rotary Luncheon honoring the uh, top students at the uh, four high schools in Fairfield, uh, Prep, Notre Dame, Ludlow and Ward. And um, it was just great seeing all the, uh, the students and uh, just 
all of the talent that they have, and it's always nice to have something positive. So, Ms. Pitko. I just wanted to add that in the last month, I was able to take my daughter to the Jennings Carnival, the McKinley Carnival, and the Riverfield Carnival. Thank you to all of those parents. That's a lot of work to put together, and she surely enjoyed it. You took her, or she yeah, insisted well, that you go. <laughs> Final comments? If there are no comments, uh, then uh, uh, public comment. Any member of the public wish to come forward to talk about any discussion items <coughs> that uh, they would like to make a comment uh, now that the board has discussed various items? Please state your name and address. Suzanne Miska, 123 Rygate Road. It's um, more of a request than a comment. Um, the document that you had this evening of the financials um, was not part of the enclosure, so if the public could get a copy of that, that would be helpful. The other piece is um, the copy that you're referencing with the yellow highlighting, I believe was left in the back of the room, but we didn't have a color copy. So I don't know what the yellow is. There was somewhat of a gray, then there was, the rest of it all looked white. Um, it, so for the public to kind of keep pace with what you're all discussing and you have in front of you, if we could somehow either make an enclosure or something so that we can participate and understand kind of what you're looking at, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Any other member of the public wish to come forward and make a comment? I see nobody coming forward, so now on to adjournment. A motion to adjourn. Uh, Ms. Pitko, second. Mr. Acer, all in favor, please raise your hand. It is, please raise your hand. Please raise your, it's a unanimous. Thank you very much.